calling a meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order. Today is Tuesday, October 15th at 6.03 p.m. Welcome, everyone. And the first order of business on the agenda is approving minutes of September 17th. <clears throat> um, there have been a couple of issues uh, that have been brought to my attention um, and that I also noticed uh, with our minutes. And so I want to give the committee um, a few minutes to, to take a look, but maybe also um, what I'm hoping we can do is uh, bring these minutes back with any edits that are compiled for today for a vote for at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that some of the changes are significant enough where it will take some revision and possibly review um, of the video from our, our last meeting. And in addition, um, there's also a set of minutes on here, August 20th meet, uh, minutes, which are not actually included on the agenda, but the August 20th minutes um, are s referring to themselves for approval. So in any case, just to uh, give you a couple minutes to take a look, if there's anything that, that jumps out at you, uh, please let us know. And then uh, you can also send me some edits uh, after the meeting. And I will make sure they appear in our next version. Mr. Dumling? On item 3A of the August 20th minutes, uh, at the t so uh, actually in the last line before item 3A, um, Mr. Donius would like to extend a call for the community to participate in CPAC. So CPAC has S-E-P-A-C, not C-P-A-C, which is a, a much different organization. Um, and, the, and then one other note on the August 20th minutes. On the very last page of the August 20th minutes, um, Mr. Demling moved to extend the meeting by 30 minutes. Uh, motion was approved by four in favor, one against. Not that I'm concerned about it for this particular um, vote, but just in the future, if there's a non-unanimous vote, to identify who is approved, who is for, who is against, who abstained would be helpful. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Demling. And I'm sorry, just um, to make sure that we're looking at the same thing, you mentioned the CPAC reference. Uh, where was that again? Uh, right above it? item 3A, new and continuing business. Uh, it's like the top of printed I page okay. three. Thank you. Yeah. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, you know that there are significant uh, edits that have to be made. So if the committee um, has any edits that they want to send after this meeting, we will not be approving them tonight. Uh, we will be revising them or asking for them to be revised and then being brought back at our next meeting for approval. Okay. Okay, so with the committee's uh, permission, I'd like to move us on uh, to committee announcements. Are there any announcements from the committee? Mr. Dumling? Uh, just a reminder, the next Monday from 6 to 8 is CPAC's basic rights workshop uh, at the middle school. Uh, if you are one, one of uh, approximately five students in, in our district whose student is on an IEP, this is a fantastic meeting. We, uh, we're fortunate to live in a state where an IEP is a very strong document and a district that respects those rights. Uh, and so it's, it's something that is very helpful to understand. Uh, and so if parents can't make it to that meeting, you can always email CPAC, S-E-P-A-C at arps.org, and our amazing parent volunteers would uh, be happy to help you answer any question. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Dr. Morris. If I could uh, make a... What's the good word? Generous addition to uh, Mr. Demling's comment, which is um, that if you're a family member without a student with a known disability but are wondering how that process might work, you have concerns about your child's learning profile, it's also helpful so that it is inclusive. I, I know you, you know this, but I'm just, it's inclusive to all families um, because not just, you don't have to have a child with an IEP to attend one of CPAC's workshops. Um, and particularly this one's around basic rights, which is, um, happens throughout a process, but it could be about the beginning of a process if there are concerns about a child. So it really is an inclusive event for everybody, every family member. Thank you. Any other announcements from the committee? Okay. Um, moving us on then to the next item on the agenda, um, public comment. So at this time, I am opening uh, us up to public comment. If anyone has a comment they would like to make, um, please feel free to come to the mic. 
And for those who can't see, we don't really have anyone in the audience, but just in case somebody comes flying through the doors, <laughs> we are officially in public comment. Okay, seeing no one, I am going to close public comment. Uh, as a reminder to the community and to the committee, um, we will always receive comments from the community at any time sent via email at schoolcommittee at arps.org or you can also uh, get in touch with Dr. Morris and others um, at the district office to share public comment uh, with the school committee. Moving us on to the next item on the agenda is a superintendent's update. Dr. Morris. Uh, Dr. Morris, you might want to press the button. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been a while um, since I've been in this space. So um, it's in the packet. And some of these updates were shared at the region as well, but um, perhaps have a different um, information because it's focused on the elementary district. So uh, the Puerto Rico flag raising event was, it seems like a long time ago, but it was September 23rd. We had over 100 people gathered for the event and kind of something I didn't share at the regional meeting, but a kindergarten students from Fort River School performed Que Bonita Bandera, which is a song, um, classic song uh, around the Puerto Rican flag to close the event. Uh, thank you to Mr. Ordonez for coming and addressing the audience. It was a beautiful event, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning, although I've said it before uh, in different venues, that this event was changed because uh, as opposed to the event we historically had happened in November, which was much more about dis Columbus discovering uh, Puerto Rico, uh, this was focused uh, on Puerto Rican uprising uh, in Lares and uh, a push towards um, something that's more aligned with our district's values. Um, also, um, those of you who were there might have seen that WGBY was there doing some filming and actually in about, let's see, that clock confuses me. So about 50 minutes, uh, for those of you who are watching, we don't want you to not watch this show because we know it's live. Um, but WPBS, it'll, it'll, I mean, PBS will show it uh, multiple times, but they are celebrating, in their celebration of Hispanic or Latino Heritage Month, they visited um, Holyoke, Amherst, and the towns in the Berkshires to learn how Western Massachusetts celebrated our local Latino community. So it's on from, I believe, 7 to 7.30, and then it'll be run again, and we'll try to get the link and share it with our community. But I know Dr. Guevara is featured, as well as some of the um, events that day are featured in their video. So I thought it's worth sharing, and I'll, once the link becomes live, the only link I have is the preview, which is about 50 seconds long, but uh, the full video I'll be sure to share with everybody. Great, thank you. Mr. Dr. Jima. This may seem um, a bit orthogonal to what you just brought up, but um, I'm just reminded, because I think you mentioned it very briefly, that at the Roger Wallace Excellent Instant Teaching Award that was a um, ceremony that was on October 6th, um, celebrated uh, Blanca Osorio Castillo, um, who is a, an immigrant from Colombia, who's an English as a second language teacher at Crocker Farm for the remarkable work she did. And I just, if we're gonna have Latino celebration month, which I guess might have been September, but still, I want to extend it a little bit. Um, it was just a remarkable evening because it really centered around the work that she uh, does as well as the life that she has lived. Uh, and it was very inspiring. And you could see the way in which there, a lot of the things we talk about around building a supportive community um, for all students, but also um, students maybe new to our community and our country is was really remarkable. And, uh, in moving. I don't know if you had anything. I guess my question for your update is whether you had anything to add to that. Uh, a very brief one, which is today is actually the last day of Latino Heritage Month. It's from September 15th to October 15th, so you got it in there. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think that's why WGBY is showing it today, um, kind of at the conclusion of that month. Uh, but that's a good segue. I'm going to go out of order uh, based on Mr. Nakajima's comment to number eight on that. Uh, the document, which is the reason I wasn't, and I was sad to miss the Roger Wallace Excellence in Teaching Award event. It's the first one I've missed in quite a while. But I was actually driving to Boston because early in the morning I uh, provided, I was invited and provided testimony. I was invited by Senator Hines and Representative Paish. Um, they're chairs of a special commission on improving efficiencies relative to student transportation. Um, so it was because of Amherst, Concord, and Cambridge were um, the three districts that implemented a pilot program about the use of an electric bus. Uh, I was able to talk quite a bit to folks from Concord beforehand and learned what's similar and what's different, um, both about their experience but actually about their district, uh, which was really 
instructive about how we've experienced having electric bus. You know, our district, for instance, at the region is over 100 square miles, much, much smaller in Concord, um, different how we charge the buses, um, some different infrastructure pieces, but it was, it was a great opportunity and I think of particular worth noting, I know we're talking to the Amherst School Committee, but the, uh, the Ms. Sardin is gonna correct me, uh, I'm asking her to correct, not will correct me, but uh, I believe the chair of the Educational Collaborative in Northampton, Dan Hayes, um, I think that's his, yep, mm -hmm. I got it. Um, so he is actually on this commission. Um, so when I was speaking, it was really nice to walk into the State House and then walk into the room and there's someone who understands where Shutesbury is and the challenges that come along with that. But it was really an instructive experience and appreciated the invitation and the presentation I know was shared with, I shared with the committee, which was rather brief, but I, I think it was, uh, I was impressed about the level of questions that I received. There was multiple legislators on the committee, as well as someone from the, a representative from the School Committee Association, Superintendent Association, as I said, the collaboratives, um, the regional schools association. So it's a pretty uh, good cross-section stakeholder group. And uh, you know, they asked me to present for about 10 minutes, which I did, and I was up there for at least twice that long just on questions and discussion. I would say it was probably a total of 40 minutes, which um, they really wanted to hear how it went. They wanted to hear not just the wonderful parts, but also the challenges and what the barriers were and how they could be potentially overcome. And I think the one thing that I was a, a, a significant take home for me uh, based on that and other conversations I've had with folks who know more, much more about climate change than I do is you have things like an electric bus, which are uh, in many ways wonderful, and then you also have things like um, individual behaviors. And one of the things someone in the commission said is uh, the best thing for the climate is if more kids took the bus in general. That's not an Amherst thing. It's a, a general uh, piece, and, and what education efforts can we have um, that, that go beyond something that's really tangible, which is wonderful about electric bus, and broaden the individual decision making that has great impact um, on the environment. So I'm learning a lot, uh, short statement on that, but uh, it, was, it was a great experience, but I was very sad to miss the event that Mr. Nakajima said, and Dr. Guevara was the district representative, so thank you to her. Dr. Morris, uh, just to quickly interrupt, I'm wondering if there are minutes from that um, presentation or that meeting might be useful, I think, for, you know, for members of the community who've been very interested in the issue of electric buses. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a cold. Um, to hear, um, you know, about some of the, the wins and the challenges, I think, that you've mentioned, um, you know, because I know that there's been a lot of interest uh, in our community, especially in, you know, in electric buses generally, but also just what our green alternatives can be. It'd be great to hear from other communities that have also been, um, you know, trying different initiatives in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll uh, Mr. Hayes is going to be my local hookup for that, so I will, uh, I will ask him. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. So going back to number two, I'm just going to roll through these because I know we have a long agenda. So we, the climate strike, international climate strike was on the 20th of September and uh, the elementary school students uh, did not strike but they learned a lot about the environment and activities were planned so they could participate at a developmentally appropriate level. Uh, grade Span Advisory Committee l met last month on the 23rd for four hours. Um, they reviewed the committee's charge, reviewed the middle school program of study and the process of moving sixth graders to the middle school. Our next meeting is in a couple weeks, and I uh, plan to come back with uh, a more robust, not just update, but perhaps on the agenda uh, for the November meeting, because I think the rubble will meet the road a little bit in October now that we're back in the saddle. I don't know if Ms. McDonald, there's anything you'd like to add to that? No, I, 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 <laughs> I agree. It's been, it feels like ancient history already um, last month, but one of, the, one of the topics that we'll be tackling and talking more about at that next meeting is just the overall timeline and what is the ultimate deliverable for this for this group because we've we've had a lot of conversation about that um, at, at the various meetings so I, that's going to be a big topic at our next meeting and and hopefully bring bring that back to this committee um, and sorry the region committee is that correct both yep afterward um, so I'm going to skip around some of these because I'm not going to repeat all the ones I've already shared at region so if I skip to number five um, uh, for the last couple, last second year or third year, I believe, uh, for all the schools where students uh, are invited with their families to the open houses, we've seen a great increase in participation. Um, since we've done that, so I attended um, Wildwoods and got to see how that went. Uh, Fort Rivers is tomorrow night, and oof, that's a typo. Fort Rivers is the 16th, excuse me, and Crocker Farms is uh, on Thursday. Um, but 
Quaker Farm, I want to thank Mr. Shea and others. They were the kind of trendsetter in this regard and saw a um, significant uptick in families at attending the event because if there's nothing more, if, um, I think, for many families that get them places when their kids are begging them to go. Right, and, and for this is a really good one for the kids to beg families to go because they're presenting their work, they're presenting what they're learning, uh, and they're in the driver's seat to talk about what the student experience is like in school, and that's been incredibly valuable. Um, tomorrow uh, is an MSBA site, the MSBA site visit, uh, which is part of their typical process. Um, so MSBA staff is coming and some co consultants with technical backgrounds, so they'll take tours of both Fort River and Wildwood School. Thankfully, Mr. Roy Clark will be leading them on that tour. He'll be here in a little bit and um, can do the technical parts. And we, that's in advance of their decision on December 11th about accept, which statements of interest get accepted across the Commonwealth. And I think that's the other ones I've already shared at the regional level, which all of you saw. So unless there's questions uh, on any of those, I think I'll pass. Mr. Demling. Just briefly, because I know the, the word MSBA sparks interest in the community. Um, just. Briefly, look, what kind of uh, communication uh, purpose of uh, when the MSBA comes out and is talking to the superintendent, talking to the school committee, talking to staff, what's the, you know, what, are they just asking technical questions? Are they asking for direction? What's the story there? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So I think a couple things they're doing is looking for updates from the larger community. So there's both school committee members, staff from the district, but also town staff and town elected officials as well. Um, and what they're trying to get is, what's the state of the town? Um, how are things going? What's the progress that's made? Is this part of the you know, topical conversation going on at the town level? And so they'll have some conversations about that. And then it really turns into the technical side of um, what is the condition of the building? What have we done to ameliorate some of the conditions? What are things that are very challenging to ameliorate given the condition of the building? So um, it's a mix of kind of talking about how things are going, what's, um, what's going on in the community, as well as a technical side, again, that Mr. Roy Clark would be primarily in charge of uh, walking folks through. Okay, if there are no other questions for the superintendent. Um, Thank you, Dr. Morris, for that. And we will move on uh, to the next item on the agenda. <clears throat> we have a very packed agenda tonight, so I'm trying to keep us moving. <laughs> um, first item is, uh, or the next item, sorry, is a Caminantes program update. So this is a discussion to provide an update on the implementation of the dual language program at Fort River Elementary School. Uh, Dr. Morris, is there anyone that you want to introduce sure. to this so segment? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so Ms. Richardson, who's our coordinator, will be uh, presenting how things are going six weeks in. Um, and we put this on the agenda intentionally because we didn't want to wait till six months in before we talked about it, but I also just want to caution us that we're also talking about six, week of, six weeks of school with five-year-olds. So uh, I think there's a lot to share, but um, a lot of it's a work in progress, as it is in every kindergarten classroom in our district, because that's the nature of kindergarten, and we actually want to keep it that way. Um, so I think, Ms. Richardson, the slides are up. If you just press the B button, they should pop up, and you have to press the button if you remember to be heard. Either microphone is fine. Here. Okay. Great. And... What do I need to do here? Perfect. <laughs> so fancy. Um, good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't, I, I'm going to just keep it pretty brief since you have most of the information there, but I can give you a little bit of context, um, especially on the more visual slide, and, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. So we've had a really successful launch to the school year. It's been really exciting to visit classrooms and see what's happening, to hear the use of both, la both languages from the students. Um, I noted here that seeing our Spanish speakers really as language models and leaders in the classroom has been exciting, as well as even though we are only six weeks in to hear our English speakers starting to use the Spanish that they're learning. Um, so the teaching team is working really hard. They're really busy um, with lots of support and um, trying to you know, make it all happen. But we do feel like the planning and all of the work that went into last year and the support we had from MABE and the grant and all of the pieces that were in place were um, really helpful in setting the stage. So of course there's a lot to keep learning, but that was really essential um, in getting us started well. 
So we used this slide with families to help them think about a typical day, and we left it without times because it's kindergarten, because it's flexible, because we're looking at integrating language and content instruction together. Um, the main pieces here are that red is in Spanish and blue is English. So we're using that red and blue um, color code in a lot of ways throughout the program. So in this typical day, the activities on the top are in Spanish, but of course the children are changing which language is in the morning and which language is in the afternoon every day, or every week, I'm sorry. Um, so you see that there's repetition in terms of the morning. They come in and have their breakfast and conversation. They have a morning meeting. Um, and then the activities look similar in terms of having some literacy time. They have some centers where they're doing content-based learning and literacy. They have some either science or social studies time. Uh, and then the math is happening primarily in Spanish in kindergarten. So you'll see the main differences are this, the math and the specials are mostly in English. Um, and then which the snack and the breakfast, right, are, are time of day dependent. Um, recess and lunch happen in the middle of the day. I think, uh, what else is important there? So maybe just to say that the Spanish and English classrooms are trading off which, um, which classroom is holding science or social studies. So the, currently the unit in Spanish is a plants unit in science and the social studies unit is in English. And then when the unit changes, they'll switch languages with the content. So that they have exposure to the language of content in both languages. Ms. Richardson, can you add just how each week there's a flip of morning and afternoon? Yep, so every, every week the group that is starting in Spanish changes. So between the two classrooms, they're staying with this sort of schedule for one week and then they're flipping um, which language is in the morning and which is in the afternoon. And the idea of that is, uh, there's multiple, but one of them is that when you have kindergarten students, their um, access to intensive learning sometimes can shift based on the time of day. So that, um, you know, I was part of some of these conversations last year where with, there was a feeling from staff that some schools switch every other day. It's like a waterfall start and just would be too disruptive. So it was a kind of week long so that there's consistency for a week, but we don't wait too long to flip them in terms of the ac accessibility to learning because um, we know that um, for some students at 2.30, they may be less able to access mm -hmm. high levels curriculum than at nine o'clock. And for some students actually it could be the flip, right? And so the idea of that is to make sure that both, the, all students are ex getting the both ac same access to both languages. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and there's more, there are slight differences in the amount of time um, in both languages and the afternoon gives a little bit more uh, space in the schedule for some project work and things like that. So just making sure that that's equitable across languages is part of that design. In terms of the curriculum, there are students are already starting to learn to read in two languages. We're seeing that they're doing their literacy and phonics instruction in both languages. So the Elefantes uh, book there is what they're using to learn the letter E and the super kids, they're doing letter G right now. And then there's those social studies and science units that I mentioned. So the plant unit in Spanish, um, that's just a little picture of what's up on the board right now. So the, the children are getting exposure right away to learning about the needs of plants and using that vocabulary in Spanish. Um, and they really are using it. It's great to see. Lots of repetition, lots of practice, but it's all happening. Um, so there's a lot of ongoing support that we're providing to continue as the program develops. The, as, I, as I mentioned, the foundational work last year was really helpful. So we did have a map of the year and what the units would be and that sort of thing. But we'll continue to support the unit planning and lesson development throughout to get more specific. So we have support from the science coordinator. Um, we're looking at the new curriculum materials. And luckily, they're actually aligned very well to the new standards, so we have an opportunity there to kind of improve our practice. Uh, we'll have a coming at this leadership team that will meet again periodically this year. And in terms of the activities, there's a team building session with the coming staff um, that's being supported just to look at how our structures are kind of working there. 
we have our weekly meetings and our some of our staff are participating still in the bilingual education coursework at UMass and so that work continues as well. In family engagement, we made a lot of effort to really think through how to continue to stay in touch with families. There was an opportunity for families to hear about the dual language program at their orientation session, but then we also held a specific evening event just for coming at these parents to learn more where we shared um, some of this foundational information and we talked about literacy learning in two languages and things that, you know, tried to answer any questions that might be coming up for them. Teachers are using the Remind app as well as their regular homeschool communication folders to send lots of messages home. Um, we've seen a lot of excursions and adventures already in the beginning weeks of school, so lots of communication. And then, of course, as everyone has the opportunity, they'll be invited for open house and conferences soon. That work will continue throughout the year, too. We don't have the next dates planned, but we've planned to have a series of parent events, knowing that we'll need to continue supporting conversations for that group. So that's all I have. Thank you very <laughs> much, Ms. Richardson. Really appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. I'm going to pause for a moment to see if there are any questions from the committee <clears throat> for either Dr. Morris or Ms. Richardson. Um, Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Dunley. Thank you so much for this update. It's really exciting to see how all the planning is really paying off. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking about planning, I guess I'm, and this may be way too soon, but I, I realize that this is a program where we're going to need to be planning for each subsequent year. So are we going to be able to, I, you had a nice slide with all the support that we've had as we've been rolling out this program and that we had the past year, but as we get ready to next year welcome a new kindergarten class and move this class up into the first grade um, just maybe just some updates on how that planning is going or tell me that it's too early and we'll talk about it in a couple mm -hmm. weeks that would be fine too sure so there are some pieces that have been sort of included in the process around first grade um, we were able to purchase curriculum materials for first grade and include those teachers in the professional development over the summer so they're actually starting to use some of those materials now um, so that's great because they have an opportunity to really dig in, but without the pressure of having to do it right now and do it in two languages. So they're appreciating that. Um, and they're able to give me feedback on what's working and what they need. Um, and so the other thing that is exciting but not known yet is that we did hear that the bilingual education grant will be coming out again. So I imagine there's a possibility that we'll have that extended support um, through the grant process. But certainly we're looking to provide the same level of support and foundational work for each grade level as we move up to make sure they're successful. I don't know what else. Yeah, I think the only thing that was on a slide, I'm not sure if it was stated explicitly, and I apologize if it was, is that we've contracted with MABE to do a program evaluation and mm. make recommendations as we expand um, so that uh, we know it's a seven-year journey mm -hmm. and a successful first year doesn't necessarily guarantee you a successful year two or year three. And we thought, particularly as this is the first year, that they can, um, that Mabe could give us feedback given their experience, uh, both on how kindergarten went, but also make recommendations as, as the program expands, things that we should be doing and thinking about. So there, I think it's four site visits mm -hmm. they're going to make throughout the year and then make uh, recommendations in time, you know, before the summer next year so that we have that and we can plan the professional development that's needed. Yeah. Mr. Dunling? Yeah, thank you for this. Um, so I'm interested in uh, what, if any, level of guidance that staff and the classroom give students in terms of interacting with each other, um, either in the classroom or, or, or playing together. You know, this idea of like the language is something you use in real life. And so you can learn about plants and all that. But when you say, hey, do you want to go on the slide together? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what are you doing? And so is, is, is the philosophy be behind that that it should be part of the curriculum? Is it, is it like a scaffolded, uh, supported thing uh, as, as needed? Or is it just let them let them do it on their own and it just naturally evolves? Like how does that play mm -hmm. into, into the instruction? So there are a couple pieces. I'd say that that's an evolving aspect and we're looking to see where we can incorporate some work with volunteers or other folks who would wanna come at recess and lunchtime to actually help um, provide some more modeling of Spanish because many of our Spanish speakers are bilingual so it's easy to, to default to English, right? Um, but some aspects that we do incorporate are 
the social emotional curriculum does happen in Spanish and in English, right? So there are some aspects of conversation that are covered there. Um, and certainly aspects of daily routines and greetings. And a lot of those pieces are built into any kindergarten curriculum. And so those are all happening in Spanish as well. Um, so that I think there are some opportunities that are already sort of happening and then some places where we can continue to build that. Because you're absolutely right. It is looking at different contexts of language use and how we can expand the opportunities. Dr. Morris. Just very briefly, I think the only thing I've seen just in the cafeteria is because the paraeducators uh, have lunch with the kindergartners, the ability for the paraeducator who um, is bilingual to facilitate dialogue, you know, when appropriate in Spanish, not to mm -hmm. remove kids from having lunch and having a slightly less structured time or less structured time, but for students who are Spanish speaking to engender more conversation and, and include those who are acquiring Spanish. Um, I've seen that, you know, just walking through the cafeteria, how she's been able to um, have a little more of a Spanish-speaking presence and, and promote that among the students. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mr. Nakajima? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, one, the uh, open house. Um, I saw mm -hmm. that it was on the slide there, and we talked about it previously. Um, is there, can you explain how, how that's going to work for um, the coming at this program? Is there any difference in the way that parents and others will be received? Um, what will that look like? Yeah, primarily there won't be a difference. Uh, um, the children will be leading their parents around and sort of on a scavenger hunt throughout the school, so they'll get a chance to visit both classrooms and see the work and materials that are happening in both places. Um, but the general format will be the same. And presumably, though, in English and Spanish for materials and handouts. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, you mentioned Dr. Morris evaluation and having mom baby uh, come for four site visits. And mm -hmm. I think uh, just to put a finer point on it, you know, the evaluation of this program is going to be very important for both the committee and the community. And for yeah. you, of course, in its very first year, just to determine, you know, um, if we're moving in the right direction and uh, where we can, what we can do to strengthen it, you know, and of the things that are just absolutely amazing. That's great. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, during those four site visits, if there's an opportunity for the committee to receive an outline or a sketch of what the planned evaluation will look like, mm -hmm. um, including evaluation dates and, you know, and sort of the milestone markers, because I think just engaging the committee, it'll be really helpful to see, you know, kind of what the plan will be as opposed to just mm -hmm. kind of learning after the fact that there was a site visit and Mabe came and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it would sure. be really helpful just to be able to be a partner in that process versus coming in after. Sure, we can definitely share that information. Yeah, okay. great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you again, Ms. Richardson. This is You're great. Welcome. Um, we love hearing about this program. It is super exciting, and there's a ton of questions uh, from the community and everyone here on the committee from what I've seen. So mm -hmm. we really appreciate you taking the time to, to come and, appear and talk to us um, about what the program is doing and how things are going. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, take care. Uh, next item on the agenda is facilities update. Sure, so Mr. I'm going to call up Mr. Roy Clark to provide that, and I think I'm going to ask him to take the lead for Ms. Richardson. You provided a lot of information, which is, I deeply appreciated, and don't feel a need to literally read all the information that you shared. Um, I think an overview for the committee would be great, and then dialogue, I think, would be the most helpful thing. But thank you very much for the care and the details in the written report, it's, uh, and the images too, because, because as Mr. Roy Clark knows, images for me on facilities issues is much more helpful than the words that accompany them uh, because of my experience or lack thereof in these matters. So I appreciate um, you putting that together and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, so you should have in your packets uh, two, uh, two items. One is just the, the typical facilities overview and then another is uh, details about the uh, water fountain projects. Um, and uh, so just to go over things briefly, if I may first, though, uh, make a shameless plug. Um, the first item on your, uh, in your packet is about staffing. We still have uh, an electrician position open. Um, we are currently searching for a temporary bus driver maintainer. And the assistant facilities, facilities director position interviews are upcoming. The, uh, the posting closes on the 20th. So those of you out there who know someone who might be interested, uh, let them know. Thanks. Um, other current topics, uh, last year at this time, pest management was a, a, was a huge issue. 
Uh, this summer we had uh, plenty of challenges with um, hornets and wasps, um, and as the weather goes by, that's, that's diminished a great deal. There have been a few mouse sightings. It's nothing like last year, and we're trying to stay on top of it. Um, a recently radon uh, in the schools was, was in the news. It's a colorless, odorless, natural occurring gas that comes up from underground. Um, and uh, so we tested all of our schools for radon, um, and the uh, action limit is uh, four picocuries per liter. Um, and the recommended considering uh, of some kind of mitigation is at two picocuries per liter. Uh, all of our uh, tests came out well below that. The vast majority of them were less than one picocurie per liter. There were a couple that were slightly above one. Uh, so I think we're in pretty good shape there. Um, MSBA visit is happening. School and bus safety. Um, we've been having a lot of dialogue within our department about uh, ways to improve safety on the roads. Uh, and I'm really pleased that, that our staff has been um, really proactive and looking for uh, not only what issues are out there, but how they could be addressed. Um, so that's really fantastic, and we're working to resolve some of the issues internally, some of them we're, we're talking with the town about, um, and it's, it's, it's just a great thing to have happening. Um, we've also been very active with roofing. Uh, you know we have a lot of old roofs, uh, and it's a big concern. Um, last year at Fort, at uh, Crocker Farm, my, my first week, uh, water was pouring in through the skylights. I remember it well. Um, and there were problems in the library. So we've been addressing those issues as well as uh, Fort River, um, doing a lot of extra work there on the roof to be proactive as possible. Um, there's a substance that we can put down over the aging roof, uh, which is uh, helpful, uh, but there's no guarantees. Um, we've spread, uh, I think it's 600. Uh, square feet now, there's another 1,000 square feet that we want to spread so long as the weather cooperates um, to just try and stay, stay on top of it. Um, and I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Um, uh, the therapeutic room at Fort River is done and Crocker Farm, we're starting. Um, so that's good news there as uh, some of our special in-house projects. Uh, and then I have a, a brief capital update in terms of what's going on with our capital projects. Um, uh, we're hoping to get bid specs for the skylight replacements at Crocker Farm. Um, the big temporary chiller that we had planted in the, in the ground outside of uh, Fort River uh, is going to be hauled away uh, shortly. Um, it was a relief to have that there. Um, there's more for us to do in terms of infrastructure so that if one of our ancient chillers dies and can't be repaired, to be able to quickly bring cooling in. So we're going to continue with that over the, over the winter. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting contracts signed for the analysis of our electrical infrastructure so that we can get some uh, really clear data on where our highest risks are and what we need to do about that. Um, and in terms of the uh, ADA study, um, um, I've got a water fountain uh, project coming up. Um, where we're going to target the most used water fountains first. Um, we're also still working on uh, ways to address some of the outside accessibility issues, uh, some of which we're hoping to team up with the town on, but that's, I don't have any details on that yet. Um, and uh, looking at getting some furniture during the school year that will be more accessible as well. Um, uh, the Crocker Farm study is uh, in its final stages of, of draftiness, and we're hoping that uh, we can close that up shortly. Uh, and just as a last note, we're already starting to talk about next year's capital plan. Uh, so that's a, a sort of a quick summary, and I can go into more details about any of it that you like, water fountains or such. Thank you, Mr. Roy Clark. Um, so I'm going to ask the committee if there are any questions. Um, Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I just wanted to, on the, on the, it's the skylights and the roofs, um, it's great you're doing, I, let me ask you the question actually, have there been, is, are the, is where you're covering the roofs with this uh, new substance, is it, um, it because there have been um, leaks identified or is it purely you're getting out in front of a problem or is it both? So the, the, the coatings that we're doing are at Fort River. 
Um, and um, John is here, and he may have some more details for me on that. Um, it's uh, areas that we know are problem areas, but the problem is the new problem areas crop up every year. <laughs> so we're addressing the issues that we know as best we can. Is that sort of a Do you want to come up to the, you can come and have a seat over here. As just make sure, as, I'm sorry, just make sure the mic is on. There yep. you go. As far as Fort River, I've already covered the prone areas of the roof that's known to multiple cracks, you know, through the year. And usually I'll focus on those areas and also do a walk around. So what I'll do is most of them have been the roof drains themselves have, have had issues with. So I focus on the roof drains and any areas where the angles change, where there's um, uh, uh, rain guards, that, um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. As far as um, Crocker Farm, I had um, a gentleman from Rubber Roofing come up and what has happened over at least the last winter was a quick temperature change. So when you have the, the um, skylight, the, pl the plastic itself with the gasket and the aluminum frame, you have that sudden temperature change from maybe 20 degrees and almost the next day it jumps up to 40. The material can't adapt that quickly. So if you get like a heavy slush or rain, it seeps in. So I called the manufacturer uh, in California and he recommended a couple areas t to do right now and they, it's worked fine. Right. You. And you have a, a, a picture of a couple of examples of that in your packet. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, can you just identify yourself for the minutes? Oh, John uh, Cody? Uh, thank you. Yes. Mr. Cody. Thank you, Mr. Cody. Ms. McDonald? I just have a quick question on the, um, uh, the exterior work that you described under the ADA um, work. You mentioned that you talked about it, that you're addressing some of the issues possibly with the Amherst DPW. Can you just very briefly describe what, what those issues are that you're working on and what and so, how the DPW is working, partnering with you on that. So um, I walked around uh, all three schools uh, with Guilford Mooring. We looked at uh, the issues that were identified in the ADA study, particularly uh, the slopes of parking areas, uh, the unevenness uh, at um, entrances to sidewalks and just the sidewalks in general, um, accessibility to um, benches and tables that were out in the grass uh, with no clear path uh, and access into playgrounds. Um, and he was very helpful in uh, evaluating those and coming up with an idea of what kind of budget we would need to address those. Um, how we address those and how we fold it in or schedule it with uh, DPW workers is, is, is what's uncertain at this point and which ones they'll be able to schedule for us. Does that? Mr. Dumling. Um, on the, the van and bus safety, uh, you mentioned that most of the issues likely have simple solutions, but others might need serious study. Could you just give an example of some of the issues that might need serious study? Well, the main one is just where the exit from Fort River goes out onto Southeast Street. Um, it's very close to the light. It's right where uh, the northbound lanes change from two to three lanes. Um, and it's just a really hard place to, to get out of. And that's, uh, that's really difficult to find a, a, a solution, an easy solution to. Do you, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's also the, meet, you know, there's, there's different grain sizes. Um, so for instance, can I give a, an example of one that is a easier fix or two? So one is just literally shrubbery and things that get in driver's way as they're transporting students, leaving uh, multiple schools, and they were able to, thanks to the, your staff, identify specific um, streets um, that have trouble, not just at the schools, but also where they drive in terms of where bus stops are. Um, and another one is Crocker Farm, for instance, has uh, multiple dismissals. So it has, because of the preschool, the preschool itself has multiple dismissals plus the end of the day. So making sure the lights that are on either side of Crocker Farm flash at multiple times a day instead of the more typical time of day, uh, but because the preschool has three dismissal times, it creates some challenges um, <laughs> to work that out. Um, 
But uh, I met with Mr. You know, town Manager Bachelman on this on Friday. I know you've reached out to the town side uh, on DPW, and we've uh, what I'd say is we're really willing partners. Um, but some of the things like we're actually, you know, what I heard from your staff is all three schools entrances have come with challenges. At Wildwood, you have a pretty big hill on one side and a big turn uh, where that ent exit is. And at Crocker Farm, there's also a substantive, substantive hill. It doesn't feel as big as some of the other ones and also a turn on either side. So uh, all three of the ent exits have some challenges along with them. And, you know, what I appreciate it is you know, the willingness of the, your staff, of the facility staff to say, let's identify these challenges. Today I got back to some of the staff and said, you know, met with the town manager, here's what we're doing. Um, but they're, they're very committed to making sure that the roads are as safe as possible for, for the students and, um, and for the buses and for the pedestrians as well. If, if I may add, one of the things that was really interesting to me about this process is that um, bus drivers are sitting at a really different height from car drivers, and so what obscures their view isn't necessarily obvious to others who are driving around, and that was a real eye-opener for me. Thank you, um, Mr. Roy Clark, and I actually have a question as well, um, and it's also in the ADA study paragraph. Uh, the last line says, we're still looking into procuring accessible tables for all schools. Yes. And so I just wanted to check in with both of you to see what the holdup is, if there's anything that we, this committee can be helpful with. Is this you know, just a research problem, or is there something else that's holding this up? It's mostly research. I want to try to identify stuff that is usable and movable for the custodians and fits into the existing uh, patterns and color schemes and whatnot in the schools. Uh, but mostly it's just that I haven't gotten to it, in all honesty. It's on my list. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other uh, questions from the committee um, or any other comments from Dr. Morris, Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me Thank you. stop. Go away. <laughs> okay. Next item on the agenda is a uh, first quarter budget update. Uh, and this is a discussion to provide an update of the finances of the district after the first quarter of FY20. And I just want to thank Mr. Mangano, although the, the, these did not print out in color, the consumer reports, uh, for the cost centers is well appreciated to predict how to show how things are going in a visual way. So for those people who looked at it online, um, it's, a, it's a nice new um, addition to this report. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's something that Ms. Ordonez and I talked about trying to target the areas to look at in this report. So it was um, a good collaboration. So this is the first quarter report for the Amherst Public Schools. Uh, so it covers through the end of September. Um, and through the first three months of the year, the Amherst Public Schools budget is on track. Um, but as you'll see in the color coding, it does have some uh, sections of the budget that we'll want to monitor closely. So just a quick recap of the color. I mean, it's sort of self-explanatory, but um, green is good, or no existing issues. Um, yellow, there's you know something that we're going to want to keep an eye on, but it's not a huge concern right now. Um, and red is sort of we've identified a you know significant mild to significant overage that we'll want to monitor very closely. Um, and we'll probably need to identify some savings elsewhere in the budget to cover. Um, so you'll see we have a couple yellows and, and one red, which we'll talk about in the report. Um, so payroll in general is in pretty good shape. Um, it has 138,000 available currently, um, but most of that is due to some open special education paraeducator positions that will be filled. Um, once those filled, payroll will be pretty much on track. Um, a couple uh, noteworthy items in payroll. Um, we transferred in 18,500 from the curriculum budget to increase instructional time for our garden educator. Um, so we've had a garden educator who I think has worked in grades K through two, and I think they're trying to expand it to gr uh, grades three, possibly four this year. Um, so it includes developing the curriculum and, and working with the teachers to get the kids out in the garden. Um, we've also transferred 9,000 in for the creation of the English language education administrator position, um, and that's to address some of the increased reporting requirements. I think you heard about the tell and some other things that happened last year. Um, so there's just more reporting requirements. We have some savings um, from staff turnover, and we've also refined the cost share for one of our IS technician positions. It was primarily paid from Amherst in the past, but when we re-looked at the, the job duties, it's more split between the three districts. Um, Title I, I just wanted to point out that we had a significant increase in our Title I funding due to some 
population statistics. We kind of asked, you know, it went up about sixty or seventy thousand dollars from what it typically is, and we kind of asked about it, but they said it's all based on our demographics. Um, so, Dr. Morris, you may want to talk a little bit more about the the plans for that additional money. Yeah. So uh, we also asked, is this something we could bank on year to, you know, and there was. The answer, which is the right answer for them to give, is well, it depends on your population, right? So it didn't didn't inspire the greatest confidence that uh, this money would be there year after year. And so when we addressed, we thought about the, what the needs of, um, particularly the Title One population. So Title One is a grant for students who, uh, primarily, it's focused on students who are um, living in poverty or some degree of poverty. We looked at early childhood reading, we looked at our data, and we weren't satisfied with um, the opportunity gaps that we saw with that population compared to the population that um, is an free reduced lunch, because that's one of the markers that's used, or economically disadvantaged. And so we're trying to provide additional support, uh, particularly in data analysis, to understand what's working, what's not working, as we do early literacy work in grades K to two, and to provide some intervention and family outreach for those areas. Um, so that's what we've put in place with, ex you know, um, looking at our existing staff um, who had talents in those areas and uh, providing some stipend and, and working with that. So that's been our focus with this additional funding. Um, just, just so it's clear, it, it has to be spent on that population of students. It's not like it can be, I, I know we've probably talked about this here, but just wanna make sure the public understands it's, it can't be reappropriated. And there's a, uh, you can't supplant other things in your budget by just pulling things out and calling it Title I. It has to be directly uh, focused on that population as it should, and uh, we, we saw that as the greatest need for, uh, for us this year. Right, and Title I funding um, prior to that is generally spent on intervention teachers and extended year programming, like summer programming for students. Um, and then the other thing um, you just heard about actually is so the district is still working to fill some facility vacancies, um, and you saw you heard about the positions earlier, so I won't repeat that. But um, so one area to monitor is in our contracted payroll section. Um, we have one hundred twenty-six thousand dollars unencumbered, which means it's available. So that sounds pretty good. Um, but there is a couple account there are a couple accounts in that section that are over budget at this point that we're going to monitor. Um, the primary one is our extended year staffing costs for special education came in higher, and the grant funds we have to offset those costs came in a little bit lower. So we're gonna keep an eye on that. Uh, expense accounts are tracking as expected. Um, so the, the one area on the summary sheet that had the red bubble um, is in special education. Uh, we have two unanticipated out-of-district placements that will increase the special education tuition and transportation costs by about $150,000. Uh, the district has a $40,000 contingency budgeted. That's a uh, reserve we budget every year. Um, and we also added an extra 50,000 to the budget this year as an anticipated contribution um, to the Special Education Stabilization Fund. So it may, it may be that we decide not, that the committee decides not to put that 50,000 into the Stabilization Fund, instead to repurpose that to help offset these costs. Um, the combined, so the total of those two is 90,000. Um, that funding can be used to partially offset the unanticipated cost. Um, the district will seek savings in other areas of the budget to offset the remaining costs. Um, and in an emergency situation, we do have the special education reserve, which had 150,000 put into it, um, I think a couple of years ago. So there is a reserve already outside the, the budget that we could use if we have to. Um, and the process to access those funds if we need to would be a approval from the school committee, but also approval from the town council. It's a weird uh, new thing that they created. That's like the only uh, fund I know that requires those approvals. Um, District-wide support is also, uh, has a yellow bubble. That's because that's the group of accounts that has our um, homeless transportation contracts and our foster transportation contracts. And those just over the past several years have really varied widely. Um, so that one will always probably be yellow just to keep an eye on. Utilities are on track, but it's very early. Uh, transportation is also on track. We know most of those costs during the budget development process. It's too early to project um, costs for risk and benefit um, type accounts, such as insurance and retiree health insurance. Um, but we do have some good news in that group of accounts. We um, received news that our retiree rates will be going down 1% um, as of January 1st. So retiree rates with Maya, um, those rates will always be set on January 1st as opposed to the fiscal year start. Um, so those will go down 1%. We actually budgeted a 1% increase because we didn't know at the time of the budget, we knew it was gonna be good, but not nah, how good. Um, so we'll have that savings for the second half of the fiscal year. Um, heading into the second quarter of the year, the district budget is in fair shape uh, with the one cost center showing some warning signs. 
um, and we will include more information on health insurance costs, substitute usage, utility costs, and, and other areas of the budget in the second quarter report. Any questions on second quarter? Or first quarter, not second quarter. You don't know that yet. Uh, Mr. Dunley and Ms. Spitzer. Um, on the district-wide support for uh, rising homeless and foster transportation costs, are these costs that would normally be covered by, um, by the state, um, the McKinney-Vento? This is yeah. one of those mandates so, that's underfunded by the state every year. So um, homeless, there is some reimbursement by the state. Um, I think when it first came out, it was fully reimbursed or mostly reimbursed. Um, it's much lower now because of appropriations falling short. Um, for us, though, at the, on the municipal side, it doesn't, that money doesn't come directly to the schools. That goes to the town because it's a, a general fund revenue. So even if, we, even if it was fully funded, we would still have to cover it within our budget, um, and that money would go to the town. And theoretically, they could include that in our budget, increase it each year. Um, foster is um, a new distinction that they started making, that we have to have separate accounts for foster transportation as opposed to homeless. Um, there is no reimbursement for foster. Um, currently, the state is working on a process through, I think it's some... Uh, section of Title IV or something like that, um, where we can potentially get some federal reimbursement, um, and the district's going to pursue that, where if we sign an agreement with DESE, saying we'll do these things and keep certain records, um, we could, could start to get some partial uh, reimbursement for our foster costs, which currently there's no reimbursement. Um, so yes, yes and no, there are some reimbursements from the state for this. Thank you for this. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on the unanticipated out-of-district placements. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, given that it's $150,000, yeah. it's a lot of money, um, how many, uh, obviously you can't go into many details, but if these kids who are out-of-district are younger, are we anticipating that this is going to be um, continuing on for multiple years, that we're going to have this additional cost, assuming right. that they continue in out of district placement. Yeah, so maybe we'll just talk more about the process of how we budget that section as opposed to the specific um, cost. I mean, placements in general can range from $50,000 to you know, $500,000. There's a really wide range um, with programming. And a lot of the rates are um, state approved rates. So they're, they're sort of set in stone before um, for, for the placements that we look at. Um, so we typically look at our out of district placements who's actually out in around January we try to update that's one of the things we update right along because it has such a big impact on the budget um, we do look at what grades they're at and make sure so for you know if they're in sixth grade and they're going to move on we'll we'll factor that in um, and then we all also typically include the contingency um, at the elementary district the placement costs are typically less than at the secondary level um, in general, so our contingency at the elementary level has been a little bit smaller. We budget about fifty thousand at the elementary level and about a hundred thousand at the secondary level. Uh, but we, we kind of take a snapshot. We budget some uh, reserve, basic to offset that. And then if, if things change, it's just um, they don't typically change so much, especially at the elementary level. But it's just to happen to happen. Uh, that was the case this year for the elementary district. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, it's just that. If our stabilization fund is the same amount as the unanticipated mm -hmm. cost, does that cause you concern for out years? If um, No. Um, I mean, I think it's very good that we have a stabilization fund that has the money in it already because it stays there until we need to access it. And I'm optimistic that we won't need to access it this year because it sounds like it is a lot of money that we're over, but relative to the overall budget, I think it's manageable, especially since the other areas of the budget right now are all in really good shape. If there was another area of the budget that was showing warning signs as well, I would be a little bit more concerned, but right now, um, I think it's okay. Um, Dr. Morris? Just to add to what Mr. Mangano said, um, so the reason that we have a stabilization fund is for unanticipated costs, so costs that are known as we're doing the budget process, we're able to account for, but whether it's either that students' needs change or students move into our district who are already in out-of-district placements, that's really what the stabilization fund is, is designed for. So we wouldn't plan to use it on a, never plan to use it, I suppose, but you know, there's not designed to like, oh yeah, we'll keep on using the stabilization fund. It's really for one time because there were unanticipated costs, not so much that this is like a bank we should go to to rely on. I know you're not saying that, but I just want to, but I want to say it because I think, you know, for the public, I want to make sure that 
you know, we, we talked a lot a couple years ago about building the stabilization front and its, and its cause, um, but certainly we will we'll build that into what, what cost we anticipate going forward into next year's budget. And, and again, it's just, it's a very volatile area of the budget. Um, if you look at our costs in the budget for the last several years, the actual cost out of our general fund has been almost zero because our tuition costs have been so low that we've been able to cover it from our, our circuit breaker reimbursements. So I think this was, again, was just a truly unanticipated year that um, we saw a little bit of a spike there. So I actually have a follow-up question on that point. I guess, um, you know, sort of forecasting, if you can, for the next few months, mm -hmm. at what point do you start to, to feel panicked, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, so this is, if we're expecting to use about $90,000 towards um, this particular, these particular two cases, mm -hmm. and we have a stabilization fund of 150000 <clears throat> is it when we go below 60,000, below sure. 40,000? I mean, at what point, you know, does it become something where we really have to start looking hard at the budget? Yeah, I think the second quarter is when you'll get a really good idea because the, the other major area of the budget that could swing either way is health insurance. So I think once we have a good idea of health insurance, which I've looked at a little bit and the trends are in a positive direction, um, but when we look at health insurance, that's the area we'll want to monitor and see if there's any savings there. If not, um, we'll either cons look at the rest of the budget and um, supply accounts and things like that, see what the, how the schools are doing, um, and keep looking at payroll, see how the vacancies are doing. Because the vacancies, while not good, every month they go unfilled, it's money that's not being spent. So it's money that could potentially be reallocated um, to offset this cost. Okay. Uh, Dr. Morris, you want to respond directly to that? or? Seeing Mr. Nakajimas as a follow-up, so I can wait until he asks that. Is yeah. that true? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly topically relevant. I'm just trying to understand yeah. the order of the <laughs> answers, right? So yeah. we go to Dr. Morris first or to you? So, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out together whether this is <laughs> um, connected. Uh, so I guess one, one question when you're going through that process and think how the committee should think about it, is since we get a guidance from the town of what our overall budget increase is gonna be per year, mm -hmm. then I'm assuming that, uh, I mean, I, I hate to put it this way because it sounds wrong, but uh, you, you're, you set aside a certain amount of contingency for sort of known unknown factors. You have the stabilization fund for genuinely unknown factors, and then we have to live within our budget increase regardless, and so essentially it's normal business to try to have to figure out how to balance out line items uh, as, the, as the year goes on? Is that true, including in this case, in particular for special education costs? Yeah, I would agree with that. Our budget's 23 million and there, you know, there's different categories. And I would say um, if we can get through a year with only one category being sort of off track, that's generally pretty good. Um, so yeah, I'd say there's every year there's some something that comes in a little bit higher, something that comes in a little bit lower. You know, last year we had the health insurance come in a lot lower because we saw plans rates stabilize and plans kind of go down a little bit. Um, I don't expect that same thing to happen again this year with health insurance, but if it sort of stays on track, I think we'll be in okay shape. But sort of to put a finer point on it, I mean, if if you were to say, well, let's increase our contingency by another fifty thousand. Uh, that fifty thousand would have to come out of something, wouldn't it? I mean, right. So, so if if we can, if the budget's in good enough shape, that fifty thousand that we already budgeted this year for the contingency, if we don't need it, we'll put that into the contingency since you already set it aside, and that'll get the contingency up to two hundred thousand. And at that point, you're probably you may want to increase it a little bit more, but that's probably getting close to where you want to keep the contingency um, going forward because you don't want to set aside too much. You know, you don't want to set aside too many resources for something that's a um, you may not need to use. Um, so I think we have 150, we wanted to get to about 200. Um, if we can put that in there, we'll put it in there. But if not, we'll ask you to transfer that to cover this cost. Okay, thank you. Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think, um, I think we're right to be concerned about the, the $150,000. But I think, you know, we look at health insurance a couple years ago and how much it increased and other factors. We've been able to manage um, unanticipated spikes in our budget a couple times in, in the last five or six years. And I think the big thing is not having the confluence or perfect storm where we have multiple of these happen at once. And so that's, at this point, we haven't constricted staff member spending, you know, for supplies or resources from the, at the teacher level. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think as Mr. Mangano said, at their second quarter, we'll have a better sense of where we're sitting and how much the health insurance savings for retirees, how much that nets out in terms of savings. So we'll be able to see, are we balancing or is it really tipped where we have to take more direct action? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so many thanks to you, Mr. Yeah. Mangano, for organizing this uh, you know, quarter budget review, especially with the color coding. I yeah. really appreciate it. I think it's great. Uh, it just helps the committee have a visual of how the budget is doing yeah. um, and to ask some really good questions, right, when yeah. they come up. Yep. And so I think we talked you. about you can track it over That's multiple right. quarters and see how it changes, so you, you can follow up on those pieces. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is superintendent goals. So this is uh, before the committee today for a possible vote. Uh, we've had a couple of different conversations already around uh, the superintendent's goals. Um, and so this is in your packet. Hopefully nothing is a surprise to anyone. <laughs> and um, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say, Dr. Morris. Just very briefly, uh, a couple updates. The date was the, the content was changed, but the date was incorrect. It's, you know, should have been today's date. So I apologize about that. So a couple just uh, updates. So on goal number one, I changed preschool access to early childhood education because the more that work has, has started and kicked off, um, I think there'll be some decisions to be made about models that include preschool access and models that look at zero to five more generally. So it's a minor change, but it's not just a semantic one. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. On goal number two, I changed the second clause of that, uh, or third clause, excuse me, uh, talking about regardless of the MSBA's decision that we need to um, <clears throat> begin a process to engage the broader community based on feedback from the committee at the last meeting. Um, and goal number five, some of the language was changed to be more focused on the framework, but development of action plans. Um, particular, but not exclusively, but particular to uh, vaping education, and I know this is at the elementary level uh, that we're talking about it, but the more, as I've come to learn about vaping, we're not seeing vaping in our elementary schools, it's not being reported to us, but we know if we're waiting till, till middle school to do vaping education, then we've actually missed, and by education, I don't mean just students, but students and families, uh, we're missing a critical juncture. Um, so I, I know some people might be surprised to see vaping on a elementary school district goals, um, but what we know is early education is, is going to be incredibly more valuable than waiting till uh, we're working with um, teenagers. And also about our LGBTQ uh, plus students and families and um, being much more focused on action planning around that. So those were the changes since uh, the meeting last month and I'm open to any continued feedback. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nakajima. Um, I like the goals and I think you've, you've managed to clarify uh, quite a bit of the based on the feedback you've gotten from the committee previously um, and I'm, I'm not stating this because I think there should be any edit I'm just stating this sort of for the record that one of my observations last time had been that um, for those people who might view our goals your goal our goals with you for you as backtracking from some of our social economic and racial justice objectives which have been more explicitly stated in the past um, I just point out that in the early education, uh, the response to ADA and improving our schools and the school improvement plans in Comandantes uh, and also the wellness, there's a theme that runs through them all that is directly related to our goals for uh, closing achievement gaps, um, nurturing all childs, engaging all families, creating in a supportive environment. And I'm just since I remember last time I said, hey, work in language, and it isn't really worked in, but I don't really care as long as we all acknowledge and agree that that's part of what we're doing and that you see that as part of what you're doing. Okay. Why don't we go around the table this way? I'm going to skip myself for now, but Ms. Fitzer. No, I, I appreciate the changes, and they look good to me. So. I don't have anything to add either. I um, uh, echo or support, or plus one, um, Mr. Nakajima's uh, comments as well. Oh, plus two, or, or whatever it is. It's always funny at these really important things that we talk about at multiple meetings, we get to the end, and if you're just coming in and watching us at the end, it looks like we're not even thinking about it, but this is the end of a long process, and you've done a good job incorporating the feedback, like others have mentioned. Um, I, I am curious as to whether um, you think that the, the timing this year has, has worked out. We've talked about that process, and what optimal timing is for setting 
goals that you can then work on in the middle of the year. And it's mid-October, so assuming we vote these tonight, you know, whether this is something that works for the future or we, whether you would like us to be at this point at an earlier time or, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Hmm. I think about that one for a second. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll say the same thing I said last year. I think ideally we have these goals uh, kind of identified going into summer. Um, I think in this particular instance, so many of these goals were talked about last year, so it didn't feel like I don't feel like it's affecting the process this year. If you think about goal number one, that was part of the budget process. So there's there's nothing new about that. If you think of goal number two, we've had many many conversations last year, and I mean by last year I mean last academic year, uh, not calendar year. Um, many conversations about ADA study and MSBA. If you look at goal number three, we spent a lot of time on school improvement plans. Those were um, presented last spring. Comenantes, we had so many meetings about last year. Uh, the fifth one, perhaps, is the we talked a bit about wellness at the elementary level. It was a little more talked about at the region last year. Um, so I think for this year, um, so many of these goals are directly connected to both feedback I received, some work we did, budget processes that we were engaged in, both capital and operational, that I think it flowed well. But I can imagine that being different, that committee members um, wanting to go in a different direction than what's been talked about the prior year. And I think that's where we would run into um, some challenges about implementing. So for instance, if we went through this process and, and a committee member said, you know, great, and where is the focus on something that, that was unexpected, and then we're having this conversation in October, I think that, that's the danger of waiting till the fall. I think what's worked well is we've had, you know, um, We've had so much conversation on all these topics, they don't feel, uh, hopefully they don't feel new to the committee. I don't think they've been, if you look at our agendas in the last year, you'll find these topics throughout. Um, so I think that's really the push, is to make sure committee members don't feel constrained by prior year's conversation and priorities in choosing goals for the, for the next year. So for this year, no, there's no impact, or I don't feel like there's an impact, but I can imagine a different scenario in the future. Does that answer the question? Sorry, I was long-winded. So uh, I just want to also thank you, Dr. Morris, for um, putting together a comprehensive goals package, I'm going to call it, for lack of a better word, for the upcoming year. I do think it actually reflects a lot of the conversations that we've had throughout the year and the previous couple of years, actually. Um, you know, I, I'm thrilled that early childhood education is on here. I think this is something that we've had a lot of uh, deep conversations around and quite frankly have never quite gotten it on the goals, right, for the superintendent or even for ourselves. Um, it's always seemed like something that was just kind of out of reach, so it's wonderful to have it articulated in this way and to really have it be something that we're working towards in a dynamic, proactive way uh, and hopefully can see some, some resolution uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, similarly, I think capital plan projects, uh, that's something that, of course, has dominated our community's thinking and talking and voting for quite some time. Uh, so to have that be part of the superintendent goals um, and to really think deeply and strategically about, you know, what happens throughout the year for community engagement, how do we bring that into the process uh, for your reporting to the committee and the committee's, you know, uh, tracking is incredibly important. Um, and I think all of these uh, goals here are, are critically important. I was, you know, thinking recently about the number of goals that we have identified uh, for you, not just in this district, but in other districts that you are responsible for. Uh, and again, just want to highlight that there are a lot of goals um, that you are, you know, accountable for. And I think that, you know, given the fact that this is work that is, is ongoing and has been continued from previous years, that it shouldn't feel overwhelming. It shouldn't feel like we're just sort of dumping a lot of stuff on your lap. Um, and it is things that you have identified as being a priority for you. So I just want to you know, make that point, because I think it's important for people to understand, too, that uh, typically best practice is you want to be cognizant of not overloading our superintendent or even our committee with too many goals. But in this case, it feels right. It, it's something that we've talked about a lot, it, you know, things that we've talked about a lot. Um, so I'm really looking forward to working with you um, this upcoming academic year on this. Thank you. So with that, uh, Mr. Nakajima? I move to approve the uh, superintendent goals for the 2019-2020 year. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, uh, any further questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? 
And that is unanimous. Thank you. So next steps on uh, these goals for the community, if you don't mind, Dr. Morris. Sure. So uh, we'll, I think we should, and we'll come back to these when we do item G, agenda planning, and try to figure out logical times to slot these goals so that they're not only reported at the end of this, excuse me, end of the school year, but that there's progress updates at logical times, both for the committee, but also for the work. Um, so uh, the idea would be to spread these out so it's not, um, you don't, the committee and the community don't hear anything about the goals until May or June, but actually that it becomes part and parcel of the agenda that we have um, throughout the school year. That's great. And if I may, there's also, um, I recently became aware of a model, uh, the collaborative, um, for these, uh, the, so that the executive director is also, you know, um, uh, responsible to a board for the Collaborative for Educational Services and uh, has to put together a series of goals as well that, you know, he is evaluated on. Um, and what he does, which I thought was actually quite interesting, is that throughout the year, every time he gives updates to the board, so his board, executive director updates include references directly to the goals. So, you know, whereas you have a document that has five items for updates, uh, to the board, you know, item number one might be listed as this is directly relevant to goal number one or goal number four or whatever it is. It seemed like an interesting way to, you know, I'm not recommending that you follow that directly or, you know, but it's just, I think in, for us thinking through how we keep track of these kinds of things, there's so many different tools out there that are available and this seemed like a really good one from an organization that is closely aligned with us, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, so moving us on, the next item on the agenda is uh, budget guidance, uh, goal review, and uh, this is coming from conversation that we've had previously around uh, how to connect uh, budget process to superintendent goals, uh, committee goals, uh, and just some of the broader uh, thinking that we do on this. Sure. Um, so I'm going to, again, introduce Mr. Mangano, who can walk through some of this um, documents in the packet so that you get a sense of some of the key indicators um, and then we can talk a bit about what presentations the committee might like to see later on this year uh, around budget priorities and perhaps the goals. Yeah, so I'll do a, a quick recap of where we're at. Um, so uh, two years ago, three years ago, we broke the budget guidance into three pieces, um, key indicators looking at trends and major areas of our budget. That's what's in the packet. Um, so if you have any questions on those, we, that, that seems like the logical one to send you remotely. You can look at it in your own time. And if you have questions, um, you can ask them now or offline. Um, but it gives you just t a 10 year look, um, trend look at many of our major budget areas. Um, it's modeled after the, what the town does with their, um, with the presentation they've done in October every year, which will now, I think, be in November. Um, so, so that's complete that first piece which you have and, and I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Um, the second piece is to look at the goals of the district or the superintendent and how the budget supports those those goals. And then the, the third piece is for the committee to select two or three um, programs, um, areas of our school that you want to get more information on and we'll bring those the people in charge of those areas out to give a presentation to you. Um, last year I think we did the library, um, we did computer uh, technology instruction, and I believe we did ELL at the elementary level. So you, in this room, actually had got received presentations from those uh, three areas. So between now and maybe the next meeting, um, you may want to think about what areas of the budget, or not areas of the budget, but areas of the school you'd like to uh, receive presentations from, or a deeper dive. Um, tonight is mostly focused on how um, the budget supports the goals. And we haven't really, this is still something we're sort of searching for how you want that information. Um, so if it's, so I've been thinking about it with some of my staff. If you want us to show you how the budget, for example, supports the goals that um, were just discussed, um, we could certainly bring information back about what areas of the budget are sort of responsible for those goals. Um, a lot of times it's people. Um, so what we would give you is like the goal, where in the budget you can find the funding. Um, and, and again, primarily it's going to be the funding for positions or people that are responsible for basically taking on those initiatives with Dr. Morris. Um, 
And then we can also highlight, you know, if there's supplies or additional things like that. Um, but when I was looking at it with my staff, we realized, you know, a lot of times what you're going to see for a lot of these goals and how the budget supports them is it's going to be people in positions that are funded basically um, to help accomplish a task. Um, so yeah, so uh, is that sort of the direction that you're thinking, how the budget supports the goals that were just approved, I think, approved? Um, and we can bring back more information on that. So I'm going to look at the committee now to see if um, you have any immediate reactions or thoughts to Mr. Mangano, Dr. Morris's questions. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, so uh, one of the challenges I think we have is, is I'll just give, I'll use Comenenthes as an example mm -hmm. of something where, um, fortunately, with the activity and how it aligns with something we're trying to do as a district um, also translates into a specific program mm -hmm. where you can immediately start thinking about teachers, um, curriculum materials, outside yeah. consultants, whatever you're getting, that directly support implementation that, um, if I look at that not as a model in the sense that everything we're doing will be that neat, because that's probably the, it's like replacing water fountains. Right. It's like the neatest thing you yeah. can possibly <laughs> think of in which you either fix the water fountains or you haven't. Uh, and you either have the new books and materials and you've hired the bilingual staff that are certified. You know what I mean? Either you've done all those yeah. things or you haven't, and you know because the program's up and running and you can meet the staff. Um, some of the other things on here may be harder to do that with, mm -hmm. but one of the things I guess I, I would look for guidance from probably the superintendent is, um, and I don't know when he could give that guidance because I'm not assuming it'll be tonight, is how ripe are some of these things for um, budgetary action? So are we likely to be somewhere on early childhood education where for the next year we should be thinking ahead in terms of budgeting, and if so, how are you thinking about that? How are we working on it? Um, and I'm assuming with the school improvement plans, just as an example, that might, obviously Comandantes, but I've talked about that. With the school improvement plans, I'm assuming that those are probably far enough along that there could be some glide path for understanding if there are things that would particularly make a difference in these schools in, in accelerating the impact of those plans for the coming year. Um, but honestly, it's hard for us to know and review and discuss that absent that kind of interplay with what you're thinking and how you're elaborating these plans. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does. I think one of the challenges that, let's see how to articulate. Um, so I think it's one thing to think about how the current year's budget is being spent to achieve the goals. It's another thing to think about, because what I heard, I think, um, in your comments is how do we use these goals to plan perhaps next year's budgets as well? Um, that, you know, whatever we're spending to explore models for early child, increasing early childhood access, particularly for families uh, who don't have that, um, is going to not be as much as the investment that would needed to actually provide and expand those resources. So I think that's, that's I guess, the thing that I'm thinking about is we want to talk about this year's budget, which I think would be a rather simple exercise, and I think you're right, some are going to be cleaner than others, but I think we could identify some general costs, yeah. uh, either in staffing or consultants or other items. Um, but I think the more, more relevant piece perhaps may be a, an outcome of all of these things, capital being another example, is how do we look forward to the FY21 budget, capital and operational, and how do these goals, uh, the manifestation of these goals actually, how are they going to result, um, how do they look like moving forward? So, yeah, I'm not sure what makes more sense, but I think I'm betwixt, betwixt and between in terms of describing this year and doing more work to think about what might be the outcomes moving forward. Um, and, and one piece that might bridge the gap a little bit um, that we wanted to do in this year's budget package is for the budget additions, for the budget reductions potentially, um, is have a new column this year that actually um, is sort of like a footnote to the goals. So if there's a addition for something, we'll clearly identify in the budget additions page what goal that addition is for. Um, so I think with these and with that, that'll start to get at what you're talking about of like, so if the preschool uh, uh, study says, you know, 
increase um, financial support to the preschool program so more students can attend, and we had a line item for that, we could mark that um, in the addition page, um, hypothetically. Yeah, I did. And, and um, my assumption is, as, as we talk about a lot at, at this committee and other districts, um, we don't have a lot of money, and it's not like we're going to get a lot more money. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really meaning this in the sense that, you know, you're, that anyone around here is creating really big plans other than budgeting. So it really, I think, I think the notion that the budgetary discussion is more on the margins or incremental, um, or even sometimes it may be a matter of if we, if the forecasting doesn't look as good for next year, where do we choose to save? Um, a position or, or an area. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the idea that there's an interplay between um, these goals, and, and I think the key point on it, again, cause, is that the goals are really reflective of broad operational priorities for the district as a whole. So not to sound funny about this, but it's not like we're talking about some discrete goal that you personally have that you really care about. Um, these, I mean, advancing the school improvement plans for the three elementary schools is sort of just an important thing to do anyway, and it's something you're gonna be working on this year. And so then the question would be, as we move towards January, um, are, what, are the, what are the operational implications we're seeing for budgeting that arise out of that? And I'm assuming they're actually gonna be marginal, not, I mean, if you, if you have a, a really breakthrough moment to discuss vastly expanding our early childhood education thing, I'm assuming you'll talk to the chair and have a special meeting on the subject. I mean, otherwise it's gonna be, you know. In the margins. Any response, Dr. That's, <laughs> that's a tempting one. So, um, so I think actually that's, goal number one is perhaps, and I don't know what the, the answer is to goal number one, that, that's in process. Actually, a lot of work is happening right now on that. Um, but I think the, the, the key, key part of that is the first clause, and through collaboration, Town of Amherst and Community Action Head Start, and then the second part of it, develop multiple potential models. Um, so I think everything else on here, and, and capital to a certain extent as well, but number three, number four, number five, those are all things that have to essentially be, as you suggested, as priorities. How do we prioritize the funding that we have? Uh, Title IIA, you know, funding which goes to professional development. Title IV, how do we uh, spend some, the, the, relative to the entire budget, relatively small discretionary pockets we have to have our priorities. Number one and two feel, you know, a bit different in terms of the capital requests and then the potential for early childhood expansion. Just to, I, would, I do want to respond that I see number one and two is substantially different than three through five. Well, just to add on that, I mean, I think, um, not to jump on this comment, but it, it does raise a few other questions for me. I think number two in particular, given that it was a study that was completed last spring, that we've been talking about uh, for a few months now, and that uh, Mr. Roy Clark and others have been working on prioritizing different projects. That one feels like a natural, right, to just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. I think I, I'm pretty sure actually um, uh, that, you know, at some point uh, in the recent few months, we requested a prioritization of, of you know, yeah. planned projects. Uh, so that would definitely be something that I think we should be prepared to, to share, right, and talk about. Um, and so it's, it's not something that is buried in there or right. too much of a surprise, right? Like that's something that, you know, is, is definitely part and parcel of what we've been discussing. Any other questions or comments uh, from the committee for Mr. Mangano or Dr. Morris, Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling? I'm sorry, I'm trying to organize my thoughts right now um, and make sure I express this well. But I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, a budget shows our values, and I think sometimes it's hard to see that. And one idea I have is that, you know, so I, I worked at the Independent Budget Office of New York City for a long time, and we would often do reports on topics that were of interest to people who came to us and had a question. And one thing we do, like I did one on how much do we spend on um, the typical juvenile justice case. And right. we'd kind of map out how the spending correlated with each step in the process. And it wasn't perfect. I mean, anybody who does budgeting right. knows, you know, you have to make all of these um, estimates and there are all these assumptions. And so you can never actually, you know, say with, you know, 100% certainty that this is how much it costs for the typical person. But it, it served a lot of, it, 
it gave value. And so one of the things I was thinking as, as I was reading through this is that there may be issues or cases like that in, within our own budget. And th the reason I'm hesitant to suggest we do this is that this would often take me a dedicated analyst right. months to do, and we don't have the staff to that do that. That could this. be a budget ad. I'm just putting it out. Yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> but, 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 That's but what you're it, suggesting. <laughs> but it was useful because then somebody could look at this and understand how the budget connected to these real world things we really mm -hmm. care about. And so I think it would ideally be, you know, if there's a way to connect our budget guidance with these goals and to have you use your time to produce something that wouldn't just serve us, but would serve the community to better understand how we're spending our money. Because I think a lot of people do look at what we spend and, and want to, you know, are just like, oh, is this really what we should be spending our money on? And I think if the more we can explain um, how what we're spending supports our values and what we care about, it's useful. So when I look at the, um, I mean, the Comenantes program is, or the ADA budget or this one about the framework around wellness, I think it would be really interesting if we could kind of create a report of like, what are we spending on wellness and how does it, con you know, how does it connect to these things that we care about and, and tell the story, not just through the numbers, but it's going to require a little bit of kind of, um, you know, text, <laughs> some right. storytelling too. But um, it just, and I'd be happy to think about this yeah. with you and, yeah, sure. and look at examples. But it was just an idea I had. And I, I think we'd have to find a way to kind of combine that work with the budget guidance for us, because I feel like it's a lot to ask for. And if other folks thought this was a good idea, maybe yeah, just putting it absolutely. out there. Dr. Morris? Yeah, and I think the big variable, not to be answered right now, is, and maybe it's the distinction I was trying to cut um, before, is that for number one and two, at least the outcomes might be potentially, you know, budget asks moving forward that are pretty significant. For three through five, I would venture to say, and, and Mr. Manigano, I'm open to your feedback, but most of the costs are actually about staff time. They're not about other expenses. So I think one of the challenges always is how do we account for financially staff time on topics? And it sometimes can feel awkward to put, well, there was a meeting with every administrator and a uh, someone working on any of these items and if you cost that out it's a pretty expensive meeting right so we try to really be very clear on um, on our protocols and agenda so that we get the most out of those meetings and I think that's that cost is probably going to be the greatest for a lot of our goals and how to account for that and again I'm not I'm asking it it's not a rhetorical question but I'm not looking necessarily for an, an answer now it would be something that you know certainly working with Mr. Mangano would be worth talking about how to represent that because um, that actually probably is the greatest cost right now on, on number three, number four, and number five. Mr. Dumley. So I know you're getting a lot thrown at you about how to present this, and it doesn't seem like we have it's all one good, It's all good stuff so far. Unified so. theme. So in, in my experience, the thing I find most helpful when I get your budget presentations and, and, and data deep dives or, or high level overviews is, is to find out the, the show, uh, to the, say that again, to, I, want, I want to know the story behind the largest changes mm -hmm. in the line items, whether they're non-discretionary line items or whether they're discretionary line items. So for example, you have a, I don't know if these charts are part of this agenda item tonight, Mr. Reynolds, these line charts? Indicator yes. The, okay. Yeah. So you have one, for example, percent charter tuition total spending. And it's, it's going up and up and up and up. Yep. And you have a really helpful uh, detail here that says, uh, during the time period, our enrollment fell by seven students, but the re state reimbursement dropped by over 200,000 because we, don't, we didn't see enrollment growth. Right. And so, so that's a really helpful story, both for the committee and for the public, that we're doing a really good job in decreasing our charters to students, but the funding <laughs> approach is so twisted that we only get reimbursed for increase, and even that right. is underfunded by the state. Right. right. So that's a good story to highlight and to tell and to educate and informs our decision making. On the non-discretionary items, um, one would imagine that the biggest changes would be partially informed by the superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. There could be other reasons, though, as well, right? And the superintendent and the rest of the yeah. staff in the school do other things that are outside of the students superintendent goals that can affect the discretionary line items. So if there's something that's been chugging on at a certain value and all of a sudden it goes up or down, I would want to know what, like, okay. why that is. And not just because I happened to pick it out of a, of a list of 50 things that looked interesting to me. You know, right. I would want that proactively brought to me. Okay. So I guess that's, that's how I approach the, sure. this very large complex item of the budget. That's good. And, and again, just to bring it back, so this, all this is guidance 
for us as we develop the budget. So even kind of like the nitty gritty of talking through this and, and what you're interested in, that helps us put together the budget document. And um, so this is the guidance process and that every time we present to you um, and refine it, that, that's part of the guidance process, so that's good. Yeah, I'm sorry to continue the discussion, but it's just, it's, genu it's genuinely interesting. Um, when I made the comment earlier that I assumed a lot of the changes would be marginal within line item, um, but the question is how is it connected? I'm just linking it together to what Ms. Smith said a moment ago, that my, that which I didn't articulate at all and really hadn't thought through very well, but I'm glad she did. But that, that that what I was trying to get at is I was assuming there was a strategic logic and purpose behind the, the entire point of the exercise is if we have these goals and we have these plans and we know that this is actually a bottom-up process, so it's actually feedback you're getting back from the buildings and from professionals we have, that you can get to the point where you can improve articulating what we're keeping, where we're increasing, um, where we're decreasing, um, is related to a strategic purpose that flows back to these, these plans or objectives in a way that's sort of analytically well-reasoned and could be articulated in a way that um, an ordinary person like, like us can understand, members of the public can access and understand as well. And, and so to me, the fact that the people are going to be the largest cost and it can be challenging to articulate, I mean, to me, even if you're allocating a certain percentage of staff time to a certain set of meetings, it means there's still an opportunity cost that you're not spending that time on something else, right? Even if it's the same, same area. And so the point would be, to me, pulling back, both pulling back and drilling in. Pulling back in a sense of explaining, so what's the point of what we're doing and how are people working in terms of process to operationalize where they think we should be going? And then to the point I think Ms. Sister was making, how does that then connect, probably doing a bad job of articulating it, but how, how, does, that, how does that then translate into um, positive impacts in the classroom and for students and how do we understand that, that logical connection between those two things? And I know that's hard to do. That's why like sort of the ethos we had for our superintendent evaluation process where we said, let's jump in and do this and not worry about the fact that we're gonna be improving the deliverable as we go and the process as we go. I'd say the same thing here. Let's just try to do it and then we'll just keep improving as we go along. I just want to be very brief. I um, really love the this, this suggestion from Ms. Spitzer about sort of telling the story and maybe it's, um, and so I would be really in support of exploring how we could do that in a way that doesn't require an ad to staff yeah. to do yeah. that. Um, and, and I totally get the challenge with, with articul articulating the cost of staff time and yet I think that's, hugely important because just like money, hours are a limited resource. And I think, you know, as, as Mr. Nakajima articulated, it's a prioritization, right? Um, so when we, when we choose to spend our time on XYZ project or program or work, what does that mean that we're not doing? And how are we allocating that, that time? And then also, conversely, how much time are we spending directly in support of our students um, in, in the schools? And, and articulating that as well. And I think that will be, if we can figure out a way to, to simply get that, maybe you know, at the 20,000 foot level as opposed to you know, down in the weeds, like it cost us $5,000 for this, I think that would go a really long way to helping the committee as well as the community and really understanding sort of where we're prioritizing our spending. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanna add one more thing, and maybe it's throwing a wrench in the works a little bit, but I'm just gonna <laughs> throw it out there. Um, so this past week, uh, there was a, um, a husband and wife team from MIT who were awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. I saw that. In economics. About poverty right? and, That's yeah, right. Yeah. And so uh, what I thought was quite fascinating was that they did a real world research of some of these had, what have been previously, or you know, for decades now, theoretical ideas around how to alleviate poverty, right? Mm -hmm. And it's something that a lot of proponents of like, you know, cash uh, payments and programs have been um, advocating for for a number of years, which is basically you give real world, uh, you know, help 
uh, immediately without questions when needed, and that's what shows to actually help bring people out of poverty and make real change happen, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason why I'm bringing this up now um, is just in thinking through your initial question to this committee was, you know, um, what would we like to hear more about? And you know, as we're thinking about the budget, you know, what kinds of presentations or things like that can be helpful? And I agree with everything that's been said uh, by the committee so far, and I think that there's been some great ideas mentioned. I also just want to add, uh, you know, there were two things that I think have come up for me in this past year that I, I would definitely want to hear a little bit more about in this budget cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you know, I think we, we have um, uh, put together this sort of math advisory group, right, that's working on uh, thinking about our math program, which is fantastic, and I understand there's community members involved and, you know, um, staff and others who have been invited to be a part of the process. Sure. Uh, I do think it, because there have been certain gaps identified in the past year that it would be really helpful to understand what portion of the budget will be applied to help with that, even as we're working through uh, the changes potentially to the curriculum and the program. But I think just, you know, the, the issues raised were concerning enough that, you know, are there sp like specific pieces of the budget that we want to think about adding to help um, maybe, uh, you know, accelerate, I guess, the, the results. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, paraprofessional training and development. And so, again, thinking about this, uh, you know, couple that has just won this amazing prize, um, and the research showing the impact that real-world investments make, we know that our paraprofessionals are usually in the front line of helping students who need the most help, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's been raised by community members enough times with me about what kinds of training and development are we offering our right. paras to make sure that they can actually uh, address you know, some of these really difficult problems and issues that they deal with. So I personally think it's important for us to hear um, about our paraprofessional program. And I know it varies depending on you know, the, the kids that they're working with, yeah. the schools that they're in, the programs that they're working on. Uh, but if there's any way that we can get a more uh, we can get more information about um, our paras and, and the supports that we could possibly be providing to them to help them with their work. That would, I think, help a lot too. So that's, uh, I'm looking around to see if there's anything else from the committee, um, but I think we're probably taxed out on this topic. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mangano. I really appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is uh, capital project process and engagement. And uh, so this is just a discussion, not just a discussion, a discussion to describe uh, the process for capital requests to the town council and the new role of liaison to the town council from the school committee. Um, and so this is basically an item on the agenda to address uh, some of the very quick moving uh, items that we've been talking about in our capital project um, uh, request process, and then also uh, to get an update from our liaison, who is Mr. Nakajima. So uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add or say before we dive in? OK. OK. So Mr. Nakajima, I'm going to look to you <laughs> to see if there's an update or just a couple words you want to say to the committee about how this has gone so far. Good evening, <laughs> uh, two words. Uh, no, uh, so uh, was it the week before last? Um, uh, Dr. Morris and myself met with uh, the town council president, uh, Lynn Griesmer, and the town manager, Paul Bachelman, and sort of int uh, introduced, you know, the new role that, uh, that I'm gonna play on behalf of the committee, but also um, it was uh, fortuitous because the, the purpose was actually for uh, Mr. Bockelman and Ms. Griesmer to, to introduce a concept that they're developing to engage the town um, in greater depth on the four major projects that are anticipated to be going forward over the next couple of years. Um, the model that, uh, that uh, the president, town council president was looking at was the um, effort to engage around the MSPA statement of interest last spring and say, and thought that that was a good format for engaging the public, um, bringing people up to speed, 
um, on what what's actually occurring and likely occurring or when. And um, the way that uh, um, Ms. Graceber pointed out was just that to keep it uh, neutral so that there was not, it, it wasn't as if the town had a plan it was pulling out of its pocket on how to do all these things or that more decisions have been made than had been made, but more a matter of saying, look, we all know there are these four eff effectively co-equal uh, areas of need in the pipeline, which just for people's re reminders, the DPW building or facility, uh, it's a new fire station, uh, it's uh, an expansion or renovation of our library, and also the, need, the critical need we have for improved elementary school facilities. I mean, those are the four areas of need, just in case anyone was wondering at home and was quickly Googling to figure that out. Uh, and so um, the, we have a, uh, actually a meeting coming up on um, Thursday um, to start uh, planning out what it might look like to engage um, a public. I assume there was information that was gotten around uh, Mr. Logue and his uh, group that could help potentially facilitate. So literally, like directly borrowing from this method, um, particularly under the concept that um, for school committee and library trustees and for town councilors who'd present, be present, their job, as it was in our situation, was be to keep their mouth. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's in a kind way, dear viewer, um, but to keep their mouth shut and actually listen to the public, and also provide sort of neutral information to get people up to speed, as well as also with the uh, the new fiscal tool, I assume, as well, um, that was developed to try to understand varying fiscal impacts. And so, just to let you know, though, um, the the last sort of working draft plan that I saw was actually for this to go from like zero to 60 in remarkable speed. So the concept was actually to have um, public sessions as early as sometime in November before Thanksgiving, um, which sounds really soon. It sounds like they're almost borrowing too much from our model of having conversations in, <laughs> in January and suddenly saying, why not go to market with this immediately, Let's right? Let's do it really fast. Um, but the but the but the thought I think was which I'm which I'm very sympathetic to, was that um, there the the, the the action when it hits, like assuming whatever we hear on not even assuming anything, but depending on what we hear December 11th, um, any number of things that come up, um, the the change on rankings of the library project on the board of library commissions project list, um, any number of things could start to move these projects into a way, a mode that feels highly operational in terms of the, the establishment of building committees or other kinds of actions. And so the thought was that the public isn't really, we need to do more work collectively, all of us, to help the public engage in a way that's very open and is very informative and gives people um, as much information, shared information as possible, so that when we get to a point where these projects are becoming perhaps more sort of live and tangible. Um, the public feels informed about um, what some of the trade-offs would be in grand form and stuff. One of the things I, I remember talking about that I've, I've said before, I think here too, is that my hope is that in addition to improving the quality and level of information and dialogue in town, it also helps create more and better access points so that, so that a, a concerned citizen who's listening about one of these projects doesn't just think, oh, now I get the impact more, but rather also knows what venue they can bring their concerns, how do they learn more. And for any one of these projects, I think anybody who's talking about them would say, there's so many decision points that it could affect what's built, what's renovated, um, what the, you know, what the scope of the project is. There's so many variables inside these things that one of the things to, have, even though you have to put forward a general model of what things could look like or what variables are involved in the, in the broad scheme of things, um, the fact is there's so many moving parts that it should be the, it, it's hard for, it's gonna be hard, but people have to feel the opposite of, um, I got four projects presented, they feel like fait accompli's, do I wanna do this or not? And that's actually the exact opposite way you should feel. It should be, wow, I feel better informed now, and I understand where to go to engage more, to understand if I have a particular question or concern or ideas on one of these projects or another. And Dr. Morris, I know you were involved in that conversation. I don't know if you, by the way, it's funny, when you said 
do you have any update? I was, I mean, I was thinking to myself, it's like, nah, not really. <laughs> oh, wait, that's right. Actually, like a really huge update. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to add to what I said or if I got it all wrong. Dude, you're not allowed to say no off mic. You can say I got it right on mic. No, no, no. Yeah, I think, I think it's an active discussion at the town council now of how to approach the task, and particularly as elected officials, what role do they take, what active role in the front end. So the school committee um, model from last year, while you're right that the school committee role was to be active listeners from the public, it was a, a pretty forward-looking uh, process with multiple meetings, school committee members, and high attendance, as well as town councilors. And so I think given the four projects, that's what the town council has to decide is what does that look like across, across multiple domain with multiple cons, domains, multiple constituents. And I think my understanding from the town manager is they're still working through that process. I had one of the things, yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. I had one of the things to add too on that is that it's probably the most important thing to have said, even though the, um, the notion of multiple public meetings in November sounds like a bright, shiny object to go go talking about. Uh, it's that the, the general concept that the town council and the town and um, you know independent or semi-independent committees ought to have a stronger working relationship to understand projects, um, at least up until this point, has been thoroughly embraced. In other words, the idea that in addition to a liaison from the school committee, there should be liaisons from other um, you know, depend, independent or semi-independent departments so that we can have a more regularized communication and information sharing. Um, say I bear the lead. It's the most important thing for the most important thing for you to know uh, <laughs> is that that was that was embraced and then we're working out the details of how to do it. We have set a model. That's that's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, just for for both of you, since you had this initial meeting, thank you so much for taking the lead on this, and you too, Dr. Morris. Um, I really believe that this is an important step forward for our committee to improve communication with uh, the town council with others. Um, is there, can you describe the process by which you are meeting? Is it, is it going to be regularly with the town council president and town manager? Is it going to be with an appointed person from the town council? Have you gotten that far yet? How often are you meeting? Is there any sh news you can share that way? And it's fine if you're still working it out. We're just trying to. Yeah, I think there's an interest in, in figuring out what's the right forum and how do we have, as Mr. Nakajima said, multiple representatives for multiple projects. And I think the goal is that. Um, in I'm addition, sorry, Dr. Morris, I mean for, for the school committee, um, yeah. not specifically, not for the forums or anything. Right, I wasn't speaking to the forums, but I think the, the goal would be the school committee would be also, this representative you know, Nakajima would also be able to hear about the other projects as well. So I think that's the goal is not about November, not about the forums, but just that there's regular communication that can come back to the, this committee, not just about the school project, but actually about the larger picture more generally, and I think we're still working, collectively people are still working out the details on what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a work in progress. In the same sense that, uh, it, I mean, how, how the um, regular sort of weekly or daily flow of communication occurs uh, is a work in progress. Um, in the same way that my articulation, this is all operating sort of real time, my articulation of what may or may not happen in November is subject to town council debate, and so maybe it won't come out of the, the wash looking the same way that went in. Um, but, but I think the, the objective of um, trying to improve the ability to have these touch points and mutual sharing of information has at least been agreed upon, and um, we're trying to actively keep in, on, on top of it. Sure, the other thing on the agenda, this agenda item was just an update on the Crocker Farm expansion study, so I wanted to share that I think it's either tomorrow or Thursday. I know Anthony Delaney, who is the procurement officer for the town, has been working on the RF, the, the request for proposal qualifications. I get those confused, so I apologize. Um, but I'm gonna have an opportunity to look, I have not seen the document yet, but I'll have an opportunity to look at it later this week um, before it goes live. And what the town manager, who's the procurement officer, for this said is he liked the model that was used for the regional master use study. I know it was a different district, but um, I have more freedom to be able to talk about it, as I'm reminded often by, uh, is that um, where, you know, there, there'd be a group, a core group of staff members who, in this case, particularly Principal Shea at Crocker Farm, who uh, can meet with architects uh, once they're selected, and then there'll be a community, a call for community volunteers once we get 
the Architects on Board and gets dates, um, an open call for people who want to be involved in that study. Um, so um, I'll get more of an update, and I apologize it wasn't before this meeting, but it's either tomorrow or Thursday. I believe it's Thursday, that meeting with Mr. Delaney and others to get more of that update um, so that the process can unfold, and I'll be able to share that with the committee next time in more detail. Yeah, so I want to thank Mr. Nakajima for taking this on as well. I, I, you know, when I take a step back and I, I think about what, what are the challenges with this kind of a model, I, I think it's, it's going to be, it's, so just to state the obvious, whether or not we get in the MSBA on December 11th is, is a major, <laughs> have a major impact on all this. So let's say if we do, there will very quickly become three parallel streams of activity that are going to affect the possible future of our buildings. There will be the coordination of the town council on the capital projects communication, which is happening maybe in four or five weeks. There will be the building committee, which will very quickly, hopefully very quickly, spin up. And then there will also be the school committee, which we, this will always obviously continue to be a major thing. And I think the challenge from an external facing public point of view, maybe for the public that doesn't you know, watch all of our meetings all the time, will be like, well, what, what, what should I pay attention to? And, and where are the points in my very limited time that I should get a babysitter and go and engage? You know, when are the real decision points happening? I think that's, I think that's going to be really hard. Um, I think maybe one possible advantage of our capital project is that if we do get into the MSBA, the MSBA has a pretty clearly defined process about how they manage um, their, their projects and what the, what the stages are. It eventually comes to certain votes and, and whatnot. So that, that could help us, but I, I still think it's going to be a big challenge. Um, you know, on, on the flip side, if we don't get into the MSBA, you know, we, we could be in a situation where we are talking about all these wonderful possibilities in the public and all of a sudden we get this really bad news. And so I think it will be incumbent upon the superintendent the school committee to take the lead in informing, um, you know, the public and the town council about what this means, because um, no one is going to want to hear that news, but it's going to be something we'll have to deal with. And if the train is already leaving the station on planning for the four projects in the town council's mind, then we'll really have to make some pretty quick decisions about, well, what, what does this mean for the future of our buildings? So. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of, I'm talking more about process and process around capital right now, um, which is, I guess, germane to the, to the topic. Um, I think as we move closer to December 11th, and then if there's active planning that we start to do around, as we talked about, about, you know, if it's successful, what, what gets ramped up and how and what are those plans. I think one of the things we should do is we should actually actively think about whether um, this liaison model functions well in relationship to a, a, a separate school building committee and then how that relates to um, the identification of an ongoing capital plan. So if it's, and I think the good news is um, since we're, you know we're gonna have capital needs outside of an MSBA project, um, we need to get organized, and then we need to articulate those things to understand what their impact is on the town capital budget outside of any planning for a major project. Um, the great news is if we don't get in that plan, that other capital plan becomes like like 10 times even more important, right? Um, it becomes the whole gorilla, so to speak. And so, um, Magilla, whatever. Anyways, so um, uh, the point being is that I think two things, one, we're in a good position to be thinking about what overall capital plan is and also starting to plan on what would happen if we get in. But in terms of the relationship of, you know, me as a designated person or somebody who sits on the school building committee or the people on the JCPC, um, I think we should actually plan on revisiting that topic because I don't think there's any, there's any genius to having one set of actors or another. And the real question is, can the public even understand who's doing what? Can we each understand who's doing what? And do, are we facilitating good communication or are we unintentionally impeding it, right? And so, anyways, I'll leave it at that. Um, but 
also some great benefits. So, you know, I think it's, it's a matter of continuing the conversation. I want to keep bringing this on the agenda. Uh, just a short item for check-ins with Mr. Nakajima, and then also just to see how things are going. And uh, as these projects evolve and as we get more information, we can always adjust if we need to. But um, in the meantime, this sounds like a good approach. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next one on the agenda is agenda planning. <laughs> uh, recognizing that we have a lot of items and issues to get through during a limited number of meetings uh, throughout the year. It always feels like we could be out of more meetings, but um, we also have a lot of other meetings to attend, so that's where we are right now. Uh, so we have started, for those who might be just tuning in again, uh, we have started a new process of uh, trying to calendar various issues and, and items as they come up throughout the year in advance uh, to share that publicly so that the community is aware of what we're thinking about and planning for and uh, where different decision points will be coming up. So it's an effort to try to increase transparency and hopefully efficiency for the community as well and for the superintendent and district. Um, so a couple of items that I want to raise uh, for the committee's uh, just attention. One is uh, Dr. Armstrong, you are raised these public forums. So there was an email that I forwarded to all of you earlier today from the President of the Town Council. Uh, and it was a message sent to myself, uh, Dr. Morris, and several others um, at the Cameron's Housing Authority, Jones Library, and a few other folks around town uh, about the planning that the Town Council needs to do now based on the, the changes to the Town Charter which require that all of these different uh, elected bodies uh, make annual presentations and uh, provide an annual uh, space for an annual forum to take place so that the community can come forth and raise you know, uh, issues of concern. Um, we had these uh, after the charter was voted in and, um, and the town council forum, we actually had our uh, community forums around the proposed building project year or quicker actually last year. Um, and so, you know, we had hoped uh, that that maybe would comply with this requirement of the town charter, but it appears that the town council actually uh, would prefer that we make a more substantive presentation, which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's going to be our very first uh, forum call uh, for this sort of thing. And again, other town bodies are doing the same exact thing, so it's not just the school committee. Uh, but right now, what we're looking at is a presentation um, we have been invited to to make to the town council on December 2nd at 5.30 in the town room. And Dr. Morris and I have already been in contact to discuss what this presentation might be, you know, might entail, but of course we're open uh, also in the library of the committee for it. But, um, but basically the idea is that uh, we provide a short uh, report, if you will, about five pages or so to submit to the town council and then prepare for an actual uh, slide presentation that would be made on December 2nd uh, to the town council. So again, I emailed, um, you know, we just got this email this afternoon, so hopefully the committee's had a chance to look at it. I'm happy to answer any other questions, but of course, if there's anything that you want to add or if you want to uh, talk a little bit about what you and I talked about in terms of topics for that presentation. Yeah. Uh, when I spoke to the town manager, I tried to get a sense of is this a forum on like a general forum and what he expressed an interest in not just us but the other departments of the town doing was to have specific topics that were of high relevance to the community. So the two topics that Mr. Donez and I, and sorry, this topics calendar got outdated like the moment the packet went out on a multiple level. So we'll get, we'll get to the other parts of it in, in a second, but um, we're the six, question of sixth grade, not that it's gonna be resolved, but it's an opportunity to engage the public. Um, while that study is still going on, there's certainly a lot of interest in where sixth grade students are educated. And also the MSBA process will it'll be about a, will be slightly more than a week out from hearing from the MSBA, but we also thought um, we, we did those forums, you know, the collectively the school committee did the forums, but, you know, maybe running it to MSBA and capital um, needs of the school so that uh, those would be two topics. When I shared that with Mr. Bauckham and he felt like that was exactly the type of topics, he wasn't judging what I shared with him, but the type of thing where a presentation could be made, uh, that I think it's less than 15 minutes, um, that was a time frame, 
and then there'd be time for the, the public to come, be able to comment on those instead of a general one where the public isn't clear what they're reacting to or if it's, so it's like a survey course and yeah, the second thing you said out of 15 in those 15 minutes I wanna comment on, that, that's not the goal of the charter their uh, language, it's really around high interest topics of the community sharing some information and gathering feedback from the larger community. So that's the two topics we thought at the elementary level would be uh, most relevant. We did think about the dual language piece, but um, I don't wanna speak for you, but I, I came to the, uh, my thoughts on that where that's a program that's up and running and there's not a future decision necessarily coming on that, whereas sixth grade and MSBA and capital, there'd be future decisions that'd be informed by community engagement. We had a lot of forums on the dual language program. The school committee already voted that we're to implement it we're implementing it, so it felt like two topics were probably the right number in that one because that vote has already taken place, might not be the best one to solicit community feedback on something that there's not a scheduled or planned decision point on. Makes sense, okay. Um, so as far as looking at the rest of the items on this calendar, um, I think we're looking at the very first uh, or the very next meeting would be in November. I don't know why there's question marks, Dr. Morris. Uh, there's two reasons why. So uh, one reason is November 12th is a regional meeting, but it appears that uh, the first topic on that agenda will be a joint topic. I'm talking about a math update. Um, and it's joint because when we were originally talking about math updates in all three districts I work for, uh, when I brought that back to the folks working on the, math, the implementation of the math curriculum, to separate out sixth grade from seven through 12 loses the complete context of why we're doing what we're doing. And it, the, the feeling was it would be much more consistent to actually think about a seven through, six through 12 math curriculum update because that's actually what's happening instead of siphoning off sixth grade as if it's an outlier because we're actually being very intentional and not doing that as we approach this. So I wanted to mention that, but uh, um, going to the November, the reason there's question marks in the date is I'm not here on November 19th. Um, so the I guess an open question is, we can either change a date or have the meeting without me, but there's not an in-between option uh, for that date, and, and I guess that's what I wanted to get feedback from the committee on. Any strong feelings one way or another, <laughs> Ms. Spitzer? Um, I'd just like to add that I probably won't be able to attend on the 19th either for family reasons. So. Mr. Nakajima. Let's move the date. <laughs> that's a great idea. I, I, if somebody had to say it, I think. <laughs> So uh, again, just to, to recap, we are looking at a joint meeting with the regional committee on November 12th. Um, and I'm just opening up my calendar right now. And we then have uh, the following week, um, the 19th is the date that is in dispute, I guess, or discussion right now. Uh, is it possible to move for another day that week? Because the following week is Thanksgiving. Is that right? I will be away from the 19th to the 21st, the afternoon of the 19th to the evening of the 21st. Mr. And, um, I know this is an unpopular sentiment. Well, wait a minute, which week, which week is Thanksgiving? The following week, the last week of November, the 25th. The last week is? The 28th, I believe, 28th. isn't it? Really? That's correct. Oh, okay. Uh, but I guess what she says would still be, what about the 25th or the 26th? Is that out? If it's out, that's fine. Someone can just... Or the 18th. Yeah. Or the 18th. I don't, I don't believe we have region on the 26th. I think those original calendar was taken off because of the, the Thanksgiving piece. But um, 25th would be fine for me on that Monday. I'd have to check the space because town council may be meeting that day, but we can adjust. Okay, so how about we, um, we'll hold that date open. Is the 18th a possibility as well, if that were to? We have the middle grade span advisory until seven. Until seven o'clock, okay. So it looks like the 25th is probably our only option then. Okay. Okay, so we will get back to the committee on that date. Mr. Dunley? Um, before we leave this item, can I ask this question? Can you have a forum for the town council? Sorry. <laughs> um, before we leave this topic, is the thinking on the forum for the public forum for the town council, the presentation, is this a, a superintendent presentation? Is it joint with the school committee chair? Is it a meeting of the school committee? Um, and and if, if it is 
in possible or encouraged particip participation of the full school committee. I'm just wondering if we have any concerns about the sixth grade topic, because I agree with the prioritization in that it's, it's appropriate for this venue. I'm just worried about quorum with the region. We have a quorum of the region here, and so if it's, I don't want to step on the toes of the other members of the region if we have a substantive discussion about, about something like that. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is, uh, this is a challenge with this topic anyway. That I always believe it's just a presentation, so it's not meant to be a back and forth. Uh, there is an opportunity for the community to provide input. So there is a public comment period. So after the presentations, the public is, is welcome to, encouraged to come and, and say anything that they're thinking about uh, on topics that have been presented or otherwise. Um, so it's not intended to be a, a discussion. Is that your understanding as well, Dr. Morris? Um, this is what I've, I've heard so far from town council. This is I'm not, new, so yeah, I don't, I don't wanna, I feel like I'd be, I'm not certain, so I'm a little cautious in responding specifically to that. I know the intent of the forum in general is that there is give and take as opposed to public comment at traditional meetings of elected bodies where there's not, um, but whether there's discussion this way I think is unclear. Mr. Nakajima? I think since it's a function of the charter um, and it was gonna be members of the uh, Amherst School Committee, the elementary committee that are present, that and the purpose of the charter is to help residents of the town of Amherst to engage with their elected officials. Um, my guess is that members of this committee are gonna have to police themselves so as not to respond in ways that are directly related to secondary school matters, but that the notion that members of this committee will be able to take their listening and knowledge to that other committee isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I'm not even sure it's any different than if Shutesbury had a town meeting, the Shutesbury Elementary Committee went to it, they learned a lot of things from people who live in Shutesbury, and when they come to our meetings at the region, they bring that knowledge when they come to the meeting. I think, it's a, I think, I think the real issue is policing how far into debate or thoughtful debate we get into on matters that are strictly speaking secondary or regional in nature. So how about, we need, I think we just need some more clarity. I mean, the, the email from President uh, Griezmer, I thought was clear, saying the presentation uh, would summarize and augment your written report and provide an opportunity for the council and the public to ask questions of the presenters. Um, it's not clear if it's you know the entire committee that has to be ready to respond to the public. Um, in which case we would certainly, you know, post this as an open meeting and have, and I think we still have to do that anyway just because we're going to have a quorum there and it's a, it's a public uh, discussion. Um, so why don't we get some more clarity from the town council on this? And again, this is brand new. This is the very first time we're doing this under a town charter. So I think we're kind of building the plane as we fly it <laughs> or something like that, something less gruesome. Okay, uh, but good question, uh, Mr. Dumling. Okay, so back to... Uh, the agenda, so we're looking at uh, November 25th as a possible date for school committee. So the topics we had, at least tentatively, were budget guidance, continuations. So we got some feedback tonight on that. Uh, we're trying to do a fee review a little bit earlier because that was a request of the committee um, to not wait till we're in the thick of the budget process to do a fee review. Um, sixth grade study update, so actually that move back to November 25th will be great because we'll have um, two additional meetings from now to then. So I think Ms. McDonald and I will be able to um, do more work than we would have been able to do on the original date. Um, the Collaborative for Educational Services has requested to, well, let me say there's two things. There are two districts that are asking to join the collaborative. It's a very complicated legislative process to make a very long story short about accepting those in to the collaborative, so they're asking for each of the districts to take that up and vote at one of their meetings. There's also an interest that um, Bill Deal, who's the executive director, has on just, he hasn't been to our school committees in almost two and a half years, just to reintroduce himself, the work of the, and he knows our agendas are tight, um, but he's very good at 
saying a lot in a small amount of time, um, to share the work that's currently going on. And it's really different at the elementary and secondary level. So I know one of the things was, does he really need to go to each committee? And actually his response, because I've been through this once with him, is yes, I do. Because we, you know, when I'm talking about early childhood work, I don't want to talk about that at the region. And when I'm talking about Mount Tom Academy and some of the work they have at the secondary schools, that that's not relevant at the elementary level. So I need to get a date for him. I'm not saying this one will work, but he does want us to both, uh, what you all to, uh, both, you know, be able to connect with him briefly and then to consider a potential vote of expanding CES to include two, two additional districts as member districts. So just one note on that. I think um, there's a question right now, I think it's outstanding still, um, about scheduling a joint meeting also for this with the, the regional committee. We had also thought about maybe adding Pelham to the mix, but it seems like Pelham maybe just given their circumstances and scheduling and all of that, uh, they should probably stay separate for this meeting. So I'm wondering if maybe that item goes on the November 12th meeting, if we're gonna have a joint meeting anyway, is that a possibility or is this, sure. are we now encroaching on, um, I'm looking at the chair of our region, even though he's not technically the chair right now. <laughs> but I think it's just a, worth, it's a worthwhile question. I think actually when you're talking about agenda and scheduling, you can actually do that. So the answer is sure. I'll bring that to, to Mr. Deal. Thank you. Yeah. And then, oh, um. No, so I was just gonna say, so that item is something that potentially could go to November 12th um, and not be on the 25th agenda. And then just looking ahead to the 17th, not that there's not space for other topics on the 25th, just that we'll certainly spend uh, quite a bit of time one way or the other on December 17th talking about the statement of interest because we'll have more clarity on that at that point. Uh, we would look on December 17th to provide those strategic program reviews as we talked about tonight and, and then potentially a fee vote. Uh, again, this is quite a bit earlier than we usually do. We can push it back, but um, there's an interest in having this as a significantly distinct item from the operational budget last year. So we're trying to follow through on that at the elementary level. Um, there's definitely space on those agendas for topics. I, December 17th, I'd like to, this is again after this was created, I'd like to think that we'll be able to provide uh, an update or actually a full report on the early childhood work that's related to the goal at the December meeting because uh, communication I had this afternoon with someone working with us is that she will be complete with her work on November 30th. So um, at least as a placeholder because things could change, um, I'd like to have that uh, on the agenda in December because that's at advance of the January kind of kickoff of budget process. Um, this may be an unfair question, but you were implying earlier that depending on how the conversations go, there could be um, sort of a larger budget impact and program impact based on how that goes. Um, are you saying you think that if that's the case by this meeting, you'd have greater clarity around that? Um, it's not a, yeah, I wouldn't say it's an unfair question. Um, I think it, it's, I think we'll have some clarity on costs in terms of where the funds would come from. That's an open question, whether there's grants that cover that, whether you know our strategy would be this is what we think. The recommendation from staff might be this is what we think is in the best interest of, of our students of Amherst, and yet we don't have identified funding, but here's three ways we might approach that, but it would involve the school committee and the town council saying, well, most grants will want some in-kind support, and they'll also want some commitment from grant applicants that they're really gonna do what they say they're gonna do. So it might not even be the, we need to put in the budget account, but budget, maybe yes, maybe no, but um, it's hard to imagine this being a small amount in terms of educating young children. Um, so that's what I was referencing. Where the funding come from, appropriations or grants, that's a really open question at this point. But I think we should have some sense of, here's a couple models that could work, here's some costs, here's some ways that we could look at getting some other funding or there's not other funding out there and this would have to be self-funded. I think we'd have that in December. Yeah, I mean, that's, but that's why, I mean, I'm just sort of reinforcing your point that if the update's ready at that point, that's why we almost have to have it on December 17th because we can't possibly go into the January um, with, with, you know, potentially a significant, I mean, look at it on the positive side. You're talking about potentially making a significant difference in our community to people that we really care about helping kids who care about helping and families. So, and there's a budgetary impact for that. So by all means, I hope you can get it done by then so we can have that conversation. Any other topics or uh, questions?
questions from the committee regarding the next two meetings? No. Nope. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got January, February, and March sort of roughly sketched out a little bit. Obviously, we know January will be, um, we've got budget projections, uh, capital plan discussions, school choice forum, and then reorganization. Um, by that point, the new committee comes in at, on January 6th. Um, and then February is budget hearing, capital plan discussion, and school choice vote. Um, I think one thing that we should think about is depending on what happens in December regarding the MSBA decision and discussion, uh, January and February will probably be taken up with that one way or another, right? So if you know the vote uh, or if the decision from the MSBA is uh, negative, we probably want a chance to regroup and think about what our application looks like for the following year. Um, and if we are uh, accepted into the pipeline, by that point, we'll probably also want to think about what the community engagement looks like. So those two meetings seem like a perfect opportunity for us to plan and to just have those on the agenda, that item on the agenda. Anything else that folks can think of? Um, Dr. Morris, do you want to? So one thing that we, I didn't explicitly list here, but I think we, we talked about making a practice is having this topic on the agenda each month so that we're coming back to the calendar and particularly now that goals are voted, perhaps we could be, uh, spend some time in November trying to lay out, you know, from December through June what that, evaluate, both that, what that means in terms of regular updates to the school committee and community, but also what it, mapping out what that means in terms of superintendent evaluation. You know, we don't have to do that tonight because we just voted tonight, but I think, you know, having a sizable chunk of time to kind of mapping out the rest of the year um, would be hugely helpful to me. Mr. Dumley? Uh, just because I see May and June on the second page here, um, this, this might be a, a good time to, even if it is a stretch goal, to put in what the ideal superintendent goal approval process would be. <coughs> Um, if, if that's going to start before summer, then it would be on one of these meetings. And, you know, who knows? It, life happens and they, they may get bumped, but it would be at least good to start thinking about. Yeah, yeah. great idea. Okay, so I think uh, that's good for now. And then, uh, of course, if the committee has any other ideas, uh, suggestions, please feel free to send them along to me or Dr. Morris, and we'll make sure they get added on to this master document. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Okay, um, last item under new and continuing business is a fairly short item. Just wanted to address a concern that was raised um, recently regarding uh, state ethics compliance. And so we thought it would be prudent to add this to the agenda. Um, this is just a, you know, a quick agenda item to make sure that um, if there are any concerns that have come uh, from the community that have made their way to the committee, uh, regarding um, the possibility of uh, the committee perhaps not being uh, in compliance with state ethics regarding uh, disclosing information about employment uh, with the district or anything like that. Um, we just wanted to you know, have an opportunity for discussion on that. Um, we have received um, you know, a couple of, of uh, comments from members of the public unidentified uh, regarding um, members of this committee um, perhaps not being in compliance and um, asking if, if there are members of this committee that have uh, either family members or are directly employed by the district if that is in violation of the state ethics. And the short answer is uh, that no, it's not. Um, so we have been in touch with the state ethics board uh, the individuals on this committee, uh, well, the individual on this committee currently, but also uh, other members of, uh, of this committee, myself uh, being one of them, have checked in with the State Ethics Board, uh, have also checked in with Council to ensure that we are in compliance and we are um, sure that we are. Um, I think that from time to time, uh, you know, people will raise questions and concerns. Um, especially when you know they, don't, they, they understand, generally speaking, that they're in order to be uh, in compliance, we have to um, adhere to certain rules, which is primarily that of disclosure, of being able to disclose uh, if we have family members or we have any kinds of conflicting interests, um, monetarily or otherwise, with the district. 
Um, and I am confident that all members of this committee have done their due diligence in contacting uh, the State Ethics Board and making sure that they are getting um, you know, current and appropriate uh, counsel on all steps that they have taken. And um, it is really up to the individuals to determine uh, you know, if they are in compliance and the State Ethics Board is very clear on that. They provide guidance uh, to the individuals. And so again, I believe that all of our committee members have been very clear on uh, you know, asking the questions that they need to be asking to make sure that they're in compliance. Um, we also have been in touch with our legal counsel just to double check and make sure that everything is, is um, sort of up to speed and have received uh, counsel on that, basically restating what the ethics board has uh, confirmed for us. And then simultaneously, there's a question now, I think, about uh, just warrants um, and how what our warrant process looks like, just to kind of put a belt and suspenders, I think it was the metaphor that was used. Um, and just to, to recap, our warrants process currently involves uh, our committee signing our warrants when they are when they come through, um, but uh, in accordance with Mass General Law, it's important for the committee to vote warrants, and uh, a lot of other committees do this, um, and also or uh, instead to assign by vote an individual on the committee to approve warrants and then make uh, reports or presentations about what they've signed to the committee at every meeting. So different committees around the, at the state employ different methods. Uh, we're still waiting on guidance from our council on what we should, you know, what model we might want to employ, and then once we get further guidance from council, I can bring that back to this committee, and we can have a discussion and make a decision about what method we want to use moving forward. Uh, but in the meantime, like I said, I just wanted to bring this um, to the committee's attention, you know, and have it be as part of a public meeting, so that if there are any questions uh, from the committee or any comments that the committee members wanted to make we would have the space to do that uh, in a public forum. Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to this piece, okay? Mr. Dumling? Yeah, I mean, I would just say for my part, um, what you describe of uh, the committee's uh, recommendation to guidance from council is very consistent with what I've heard um, from my own part. Um, I've stated before that my wife is an employee in the preschool, and so uh, as soon as I was elected before being sworn in, I called the State Ethics Commission, so they have a, a free line with any public uh, employee uh, or elected official can call and just discuss the situation and reviewed all the relevant laws and advisories. Uh, they gave me guidance, which has made it very easy to be confident that I'm in compliance. And um, you know, so for them to have that legal guidance makes it, it makes it very easy to, to, to do that. So, um, but the, the warrants is, is is a good thing that I think we sh we should follow up on. And I think this, you know, this applies, of course, for future uh, committee members as well. Um, you know, if, if they are employees of the district or uh, have a family member that is a, an employee of the district or if there's any kind of, of interest with the district outside of the school, their service on the school committee, uh, it is on them to, you know, talk to the State Ethics Board. Um, as Mr. Demling mentioned, they are more than happy to share, <laughs> provide guidance. Uh, you know, there is a form online. Um, and the one thing to make perfectly clear is that the State Ethics Board very clearly will not report on individuals' uh, requests. So in other words, if a member of this committee or a member of the public has a concern about, about you know, possible ethics violation and they contact the State Ethics Board, um, the State Ethics Board will give them the advice but will not share the advice given to that individual with anyone else who wants to know. So, um, that is just their standard practice. Um, so, you know, again, individuals are, uh, who are concerned are encouraged to reach out to the State Ethics Board and talk with them and get advice, um, but they will not share information that's been shared uh, with any particular people. So, okay. Uh, so moving us along, uh, last item uh, before adjourning is uh, gifts. We actually do have gifts, but we only have one copy. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mangano apologized, but he only uh, gave us one copy of the gift, so I don't know if anyone wants to make a motion, wants to read this, I will happily pass this over to Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. I move to approve the following gifts um, from Joy Sullivan, number 2056, Fort, a gift to support Fort River gift for student lunch balances in the amount of $100, a gift from James Kwok and Sylvia Brandt, and 
Vanguard number 703232 to support Crocker Farm for OWL training print at the principal's discretion in the amount of $1,000. A gift from the Fort River Parent Council number 2066 to support Fort River at this principal's discretion in the amount of $200. A gift from the League of Women Voters, number 1249, to support the Fort River Library per the book sale in the amount of $500. And a gift from Sanjay Arwardi and Mary Clark in the amount of $683 to support the Fort River Art Program in the amount of $500 for a total of $2,000. $300. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? All those in favor? Thank you very much. It is unanimous. And I will take one more motion. Mr. Nakajima. Move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Uh, all those in favor? Excellent. We are adjourned. Thank you.